The meeting is now reconvened open session. The board would like to remind the public that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. It is also available via live stream for the public through links found on the front page of the RUSD website. We would also remind everyone to please enter and exit through the lobby. And now we will report out on action taken in closed session. Uh, Trustee Sadoff. In closed session, the board voted to approve a purchase and sell agreement with a buyer, Anthem United Homes, Inc., for property identified as APN 017-174-020-000, commonly known as Lot 49, by a unanimous vote of all members present. The purchase price is $11,250,000 with an anticipated closing date of July 18, 2023. Second action taken, in closed session, the board voted to release one classified employee from their position pursuant to Ed Code 45113. The vote was unanimous of all members present. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight we have Bahar Marathi from Whitney High School as our student board rep. Bahar, will you please introduce the color guard and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Ladies and Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the presentation of the colors by the Whitney High School Air Force Junior ROTC Color Guard and the Pledge of Allegiance. The commander and U.S. flag bearer for this evening's color guard is Cadet Master Sergeant Sophia Burkhalter. The state flag is carried by Cadet Major Liam Turley. The right guard is Cadet Master Sergeant Ryan Manning. The left guard is Cadet First Lieutenant Kevin Laguna Gonzalez. And the alternate tonight is Cadet Colonel Gabriella Larson. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. They always do such a great job. We will move now to item 5.1, Family Partners in Education. Chief Dosange, will you introduce our Family Partners in Education recognition tonight? Good evening, President Hupp, trustees, and Superintendent Stock. The Families Partners in Education program is an opportunity for the Rockland Unified School District to recognize family engagement and involvement to help our students achieve excellence during the school year. For tonight's Families Partner in Education recognition, we have Granite Oaks Middle School Principal Jay Holmes introducing the Martin family. Good evening, President Hupp, honored trustees, Superintendent Stock. It is my pleasure to uh, be before you today to really honor one of our families that does so much for Grand Oaks Middle School. We know how important it is to have a partnership with our families in order to make our schools the great schools that they are. And Donna Martin and her family, Ernie, Ryan, and Natalie are all here with us this evening um, because they do so much for Grand Oaks. Uh, I do have a prepared statement. Grand Oaks Middle School is proud to honor the Martin family for all of their contributions to our school and community. Donna Martin and her family have contributed greatly to the success of GMS over the last couple of years. Donna fearlessly, and I do mean fearlessly, volunteered to become a Grand Oaks Parent Falcon Club member for the second time this school year. Two bites of the apple, which is huge for us in middle school because, you know, we only have parents pretty much for two years and then they're gone. So thankfully we captured Donna for another two. <clears throat> At the time, our PRC was in desperate need of parents to step in and take over the leadership roles within our organization. It is extremely difficult to develop relationships with families during their brief two-year stay in middle school, not to mention coming out of the COVID-19 years. 
Donna not only stepped into becoming a PSC member, but volunteered to take over the communication portion of our organization and helped us with our day-to-day -day duties. Thankfully, Donna has jumped into these roles with both feet and never looked back. For a second time through GMS, Donna has been extremely helpful in overseeing or helping to run our pledge drives, fundraisers, dances, monthly meetings, PSC finances, and teacher appreciation events coming tonight directly from handing out lawn signs for Grand Oaks Middle School eighth grade parents, so, which we'll be doing tomorrow also. Recently, Donna has been found cooking pancakes, eggs, and bacon, which are all super yummy, breakfast for our staff on different staff appreciation days. So she did that not only once, but volunteered to do it twice. Our staff truly appreciates Donna rolling up her sleeves and putting in the effort to get their day off with an extraordinary culinary start. Donna has also taken part in past fundraisers and is currently running our GMS Spirit Nights. The money raised by our PFC has been used to fund clubs, purchase Chromebooks for classroom use, and support our staff appreciation activities. Donna's hard work with our PFC truly creates a positive difference in making our school one of the best middle schools in Northern California. We are indeed lucky to have Donna, and thank you, Ernie, for have, letting us have Donna, working to make our school a wonderful place to learn and grow. On behalf of the students, faculty, and staff at Grand Oaks Middle School, we honor the Martin family for their contribution to our school. Thank you so much, Donna. This is, again, a great family. Thank you guys very much. You, um, in elementary school, I think the principals have a lot of interest, have a lot of parents that come out and they help out. At, at the junior highs and the high schools, it's, you know, I've done my thing, I'm more interested in, in different stuff. So thank you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you for helping out. Thank you for stepping in, for, for coming in off of COVID, for stepping up for the, for the teachers and, the, and, and, the, and all that support for doing the fundraising. I mean, it, it's families like yourselves, the Martin family that, again, and I say it a lot, that make Rockland a great place to raise families, and you guys are just that example. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Hang on to that. Thank you very much. I know Jay Holmes is a, uh, is, is very appreciative. So, yeah, one more year? One more year. One more year, yeah. and then you gotta start recruiting again, right? So, <laughs> so hit up our neighbors, right? I do. I, I do. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Truly, anyone who makes teachers yummy food deserves a red carpet. Chief Dosange, will you please introduce our employee recognition tonight? President Hupp, trustees, and superintendent stock. Tonight, for our employee recognition, we have Corey Trell Elementary School Principal, Ms. Melanie Patterson, joining us to introduce Claudia Aguri, a Jill of all trades, to support the Bronco family. Good evening, President Hupp, trustees, Superintendent Stock, and everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you tonight to honor our employee uh, recognition for Quarry Trail Elementary School. And I'd like to invite up Carlos and Claudia Aguirre to join me. Come on up. You have to stand here the whole time. That's part of it. Come on up. So I don't know if you're aware, but I know you all know Carlos. Carlos is our lead custodian, and um, he's done so much for us this year. As you know, opening a new school takes a lot of work and a lot of people's part. And he and I, uh, along with Liz in the audience, were the first people to, to come on board and put that school together. So super excited to honor him as well. It's kind of a two-for-one tonight, guys. <laughs> and, um, but um, this is his wife, uh, Claudia Aguirre, Maestra Aguirre. She is, um, serves our school as the dual language 
uh, bilingual kindergarten instructional aid, um, and she is also the morning and afternoon crossing guard. She also serves as, um, um, she has volunteered to be an advisor for our Math Plus Club after school that we work with uh, Whitney High School students. And she is also, along with Carlos, um, one of the last people at all of our PTC events and all of our dual language parent events um, to be there serving and cleaning up. And um, honestly, they are an amazing team. But what I love uh, most about uh, Claudia is she's actually a teacher. And she's come to our school because of her passion for dual language and, um, and serving kids. She loves kids, they both do. And um, I'm super happy to have them part of the Bronco family. Um, it's, it's amazing because um, she just, she knows when things need to be done. Uh, we were, we, she was, uh, she helped at the dance show. We had, the dance show was outside and so we had all the classes in the multipurpose room with Principal Patterson. It was really exciting. And I had to, um, I had to like, you know, figure out how to get them all lined up. And she just had it all organized, made signs for all the classes, knew what we needed, brought it in, had it all laid out. And um, she's all, no, don't worry, Principal Patterson, I have this all under control. And I said, yes, you do, thank you, because I absolutely do not. So at any rate, um, she's just a fabulous person. She's passionate, she's professional, and uh, her expertise is really uh, second to none. And um, we're so happy to have both of them at our school um, serving and being part of the Bronco, Bronco family. So it's my pleasure to um, uh, thank you for doing this honor for them. It's well deserved. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hi, good evening. We're so pleased to present you with the certificate and gift for everything that you do for our kids at Quarry Trail. You know, I, I think Principal Patterson said it all, but starting a brand new campus, so much of the campus culture depends on all of you that are there working with the kids. And I just know every day Marin comes home from TK and I say, how was your day? And every day she says, awesome. And it's because of you guys. So thank you so much. We are just so fortunate to have you. This is truly the best part of the night. We're so grateful for our, our families and our employees that are so amazing. So next, um, we will be presenting the new Director of Special Education and Support Programs, Dr. Tony Limoges, Associate Superintendent of Human Resources. Will you please introduce our new Director of Special Education? Thank you, President Hub. Good evening, uh, Trustee Superintendent Stock, Ms. Georgia. I am proud to uh, introduce to the Board of Trustees, District Cabinet and staff, presenting Leslie Holmes, our new Director of Special Education and Support Programs, beginning August 1st, 2023. Come on down, Leslie, and I'll say some nice things. Ms. Holmes has worked in education for over 25 years, or approximately 25 years, whatever makes you feel better. Um, she has worked at the elementary, secondary, and post-secondary levels during her career as a school psychologist. She started her career in the Bay Area and has worked in San Juan Unified and Horizon Charter Schools in Sacramento. She was the director of special education for Horizon Charter School program prior to working with the Rockland Unified School District. The past year, she has served as a program specialist with RUSD and worked extensively with our adult transition programs. Her broad range of experiences in her last year, I think, um, made Cabinet feel like she will be an ideal candidate to be our next director of special education and school programs. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you. Congratulations. 
Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm very excited to help support Rockland. I I've been fortunate to be able to work here the last few months and, and get to know a lot of the staff and students, and it's just an amazing place to work. There's so many competent, um, quality, hard workers here, so I'm very excited to continue at a, at a larger capacity. So thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, I just want to say, Leslie, welcome, and thank you so much. <laughs> That's okay. We're very glad to have you. <laughs> Any other comments? So if there's anyone still here for our special recognitions, we thank you for joining us. And while you're more than welcome to stay, this is also a good time to bug out. <laughs> All right, we will now move on to our employee organizations. Uh, is there anyone here to speak for um, CSEA? I know Chuck wasn't gonna be here tonight. No? Okay. So then we will move on to our TPA president, Travis Mujez. Thank you so much. Hello and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm taking a, I'm bringing pom-poms next time and putting those around the room. <laughs> right? Because Bill, I saw you over here. That was, that was smooth for Melanie. Um, um, obviously, we get the, the fun of recognizing our employees and families at every board meeting, which is great for Rockland culture. So whoever's idea that was, kudos to you guys or the person or whatever. It's been going on a while. I don't remember where or when it started, but it's been an awesome thing. Um, hopefully, you all know this week is also our official Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, so if you can all just do me a quick favor, join me in a round of applause for all of the teaching staff around Rockland Unified. So as we all know, it's, it's those people along with all the support services that work with them in their classrooms that really make us as excellent as we are. Um, and uh, Julie, you said it best, if you cook for teachers, you're pretty much like, you walk on Gold. water, so um, it's great. <laughs> we actually, uh, like a lot of staffs this week, have come into morning coffees and bagels and treats and, you know, the, we had a discussion this week, or the, sorry, this morning um, in my pod at Whitney High School of if brownies should be in the morning or not. <laughs> we, we agreed that a brownie is just a square donut, so that's an acceptable <laughs> breakfast. Um, by at least the social science department at Whitney High School. So if you ever get questioned on that, brownie eaters in the morning, um, it's fair game. So pizza was a close <laughs> second, by the way. So um, uh, some huge successes I want to uh, bring up tonight is uh, last week we had three intensive days with our labor work. Um, I, got, I mentioned at our last meeting that we were inviting Roger to our, um, our rep council meeting that happened last Monday. Um, it was awesome. I can't tell you how well received that was. Um, by both Roger, um, Mary McDonald, our, um, our third party um, support with that labor work, and then um, as importantly, our TPA rep council, the, the ability to have all of them there and, um, and really lean into having Roger in the room. And the best part of it was they weren't guarded. They were open, they were honest, they were vulnerable, um, and Roger was receptive to all of that. So it was just a great opportunity to have those people there and have his presence there. Roger, a huge thank you to you on behalf of our TPA for that, that presence in the room. Um, and then another thank you for allowing me the same opportunity the following morning. I got to jump in with our, um, our principal group. Um, so it was me, Roger, Mary, and the, the principals across the district. Same exact prompt, same exact questions. It was, it was probably not overly surprising, but definitely one of those aha moments. The same almost verbatim feedback came from both of those groups. The same barriers and frustrations, the same successes and celebrations were verbatim, um, and it, it gave us a great place to move forward as far as where do we need to put our efforts and our energy um, so we can help reduce and remove some of those barriers or just understand them if they're not something that we can, we can remove entirely, and then also help celebrate all of the successes and the things that we've, um, we've kind of worked through. We got to hear great examples. Um, it was awesome to hear the same site rep selling, or sharing successes and then their principal the following day, not knowing what each other had shared, uh, but sharing the same successes. Um, and then at the same time, it was, it's always interesting to hear like 
the biggest struggle for somebody is like the biggest celebration for another. So that's always fun is kind of just keeping our, our balance. And, um, and uh, the term I like, uh, I like that Roger used a lot is just that recalibration of where are we at with things, where do we need to go with things. So it was, it was a great opportunity. Um, those days led into, the second day led into an opportunity where we, we finally hit that middle gap of where we hadn't touched base directly with our labor work. So we've done a lot of work up at the top level. Um, some of you board members have been part of that, that original labor steering committee um, in its original inception through uh, up till now. Um, and we've done a lot of work at the site level this last year. Um, but it was that kind of that middle group that we really hadn't had an opportunity to, to dive deeply with. Um, so we, we took an opportunity to build intentional partnerships with all of our district leadership and a variation of RTPA leadership or just RTPA general members that have specialized skills or roles in their, um, their additional hats on their campuses. Um, for example, we got to bring in, um, you know, we're going to hear from her later, but we have the wonderful Hana sitting behind me. Um, we got to bring her in, um, as well as other people that work under kind of her umbrella, and then team them up with people that are boots on the ground doing a lot of the work that they're kind of guiding us through from the district level. So starting to build those partnerships, and um, we kind of called it like a, a speed dating opportunity, <laughs> um, because some of the relationships in the room have known each other for years and are very comfortable and ready to dive into the big things, and some are literally meeting each other for the first time as well as being in that room for the first time. And it was awesome that there was no apprehension, anxiety. It was like everybody knew why they were there and literally dove in head first. And, and again, the vulnerability for people is just much appreciated from all levels. I'm very excited to see kind of where that goes and, uh, and the fruits of that labor. I know we've, we've talked about a lot of that labor work paying off in bargaining context and other things, uh, but just really excited to see where that goes when we're you know, in decision-making conversations, um, and uh, a lot of the, the mindset is really on the, how are we gonna work together from the takeoff, not just on the landing piece, which has been a huge goal of ours. So um, kudos to all those in that room. Um, and then again, thank you to you guys for allowing the time and the resources. I know there was a, a dollar amount that was tied to that that we, uh, Roger asked for approval from um, earlier last year. Um, and, and I think that at least if you guys aren't seeing it, know it's out there. People are seeing it, hopefully you're hearing from more than just me, but it's money well spent. It's it, the resources, the time that we're investing in people is paying off very tangibly um, in a very daily basis. So I hope you guys are hearing and seeing that. And if not, let me know. We'll take some tours around the district together and, and kind of see that in its um, full circle element. Um, and then finally, the third day uh, of that labor work last week, was us getting together in this room, our site rep teams and our principals. Um, and it really was just to kind of, again, recalibrate them back on track, kind of uh, have an opportunity to celebrate some successes on where they've come and where they are. Because um, again, I gotta remind everybody, we started that intentional work like this school year. It's not like this is like years in the making. This is this year. Um, and I shared with Roger and with that room that it was really eye-opening to see the progress that we've done just in six or seven months. Uh, when the model that we all kind of were leaning towards was six to seven years ahead of us. Um, so the, the progress that we've made has been instrumental and the, the timeliness of that has been incredible. So um, it was just a great day to celebrate those people um, and have some opportunities for them to just, because the biggest gift they keep asking or need, they keep asking us for is time. And with the resources that you guys gave us, we were allowed to give them release time and that intentional work time. We're starting to see and hear what this is gonna look like at a site level. Next year, there's a lot of big plans we'll hopefully be sharing with you guys. Uh, maybe a little bit at the end of this year, but definitely first part of next year on kind of what sites are looking to do with those things um, with the resources that we were able to put in front of them. And, and again, trying to remove as many barriers as we can for them to have that collaborative culture on their campuses. So again, thank you to you guys and kudos to everybody um, and their willingness. And then. Um, I always say it, so I don't want to forget, but also a huge kudos to um, both uh, Patty and Matt that over in our subservices, Matt Murphy, Patty Crane, um, for all the juggling of making sure that our classes and our campuses are covered so people could be here to do that. I think we went all three days, knock on wood, without a single sub issue. Wow. The actual only one, um, I think he left already, but Jay had a little bit of a juggle um, our Wednesday morning, but he, I think he missed like 15 minutes. Like It was just great to see that work out for, for every site. We didn't have anybody that couldn't make it because of those types of problems. So again, huge success, um, and just keep bringing that positive, hopefully collaborative work to you guys in our reports. Um, <clears throat> that said, the labor process has been extremely beneficial at the site level. It's been extremely beneficial at the negotiation table. It's been extremely beneficial now at the district office level, having 
our RTPA leadership working directly with, with Rockland Unified leadership, um, and more so intentionally. We've always worked directionally, but it's always been, or directly, but it's always been more of a, a firefighter kind of mentality, right? Like what comes up, what do we need to address? Where we're, we're so far past that, that now we're like proactively doing things, right? We're, we're clearing the ground, if you will, to prevent the fires, not just putting them out. And then when the fires do come, it's a pretty quick and efficient process. We've got relationships, right? Derek, you're huge, and I, and I fully believe in the, the pick up the phone and have a conversation, and that's really important to you. And we actually have that being embedded into our culture. And again, that, back to that speed dating comment, that was some of our goals is just give an opportunity for these people to exchange a phone number, if that's all it is in that time, to pick up the phone, hey, Mr. Flowers, what's going on? You know, what happened here? Give me a heads up. And just helping all those things across the board in the same way for it's a two-way. It's not just a, a one-way um, relationship. Um, the areas that I, I do want to bring to the attention is where we're running into challenges and barriers, um, and I hope you take this with, uh, with a constructive criticism mindset, is um, one of the common areas on there was where's the school board in this relationship, in this collaborative process? So that came up on, uh, in, in conversations on, on some of our sticky notes, when we, whether it was a, a verbal conversation or just in some kind of anonymous feedback. Um, uh, to your credit, though, the great news was school board landed both as a barrier as well as an opportunity. So that's kind of where I'm hoping that, that tonight comes off as, as an opportunity um, or that, like I said, constructive criticism, if you will, because it, it was nice to see that it landed in both places, and it, it varies, as you might assume, by everybody's individual experiences and things like that. Um, but last meeting, there was, there was a test, in my opinion, and from a lot of our members, of what does collaboration look like in Rockland when it comes to the decision-making body of our school board. Um, we heard a lot of concern from you guys about what does collaboration need to look like with curriculum adoption. So I'm going to call out the elephant in the room, the science curriculum adoption. Um, and that came up a few times in our Labor Days um, last week. Um, and I went out of my way to make sure that that wasn't our focus. I actually had a good conversation with Trustee Price about why it didn't target our conversations into that or why we didn't. Um, and I committed to Roger um, before those days started. That's not what our, our purpose was those days. Our purpose was to dive into ourselves and dive into that collaborative process, RTPA, RUSD. Um, that said, there's a lot of opinions, and I'm hoping you guys are hearing from them. I know you are, whether you want to or, or, or not, and, and uh, it's appreciated that you, those of you guys that are able to respond to those. Um, and I know as the president, that's some of your extra tasks is to, to be the responding voice, so that is appreciated. Um, but the questions that I have for you guys are just kind of feedback is the process that, that um, came up with that curriculum adoption, what we heard from the board was it wasn't collaborative enough. There was some concern, or maybe not enough, but there was concern about the, the layers of collaboration or lack thereof. Um, when from our perspective, from RTPA's perspective, and uh, as well as, again, community members have reached out to us, teachers have, and I think there's some that are gonna speak here tonight as well. Um, Curriculum adoption has actually been one of our best collaborative processes across the board in Rockland Unified from the beginning of time. So we've been very lacking on collaboration in a lot of areas. I don't know that there's ever been that accusation when it comes to curriculum adoption because it is a long process. It is an involved process. It is a very deep, in-depth, time-consuming. The experts everywhere that need to be there are involved in that process. And I think it shook a lot of people. It definitely shook me and made me wonder, hence I'm talking about it tonight, what does collaboration mean to the board? And what's going to be a good enough, right, or a, an attempt at enough collaboration when those decisions are being made? Um, because we've, we've done the things of collaboration in the past, and they've, they've led us to putting that excellence in education on the wall. And then last week, essentially, we were told it wasn't good enough. And whether that was the message or not, that's the message that, that was received by many, and at least the, the ones that have my ear or that have asked me to speak to this tonight. Um, so I, I'm just curious where we're going to go from that. What, questions I have for you guys, and I know we won't get to all of them tonight, but just to think about and hopefully we can work to address, is, um, is some questions for clarity, first of all, is was the decision made around fiscal concern? I know that came up a few times, the cost of the new curriculum. Was it a made around the lack of or missing elements or concerns around collaboration, kind of that umbrella of collaboration? Um, or was it just something that people didn't like and they think that there's something better out there? And, uh, and that question came up a few different times. It actually came up at our Labor Day and we encouraged the people that asked that to actually reach out to you guys because I don't have the answer. 
Um, and if you do, I think if, if you thought you made it clear to the, the people we're hearing from, it wasn't clear from the meeting. So that, again, definitely um, an opportunity for the board to, to work to help clarify that um, and whatever moving forward looks like with that. Um, at the same time, if, if the board is concerned with the recommendation coming from the experts that are doing the work, I think that's something that we need to collaboratively work together is how do, we, how do we get over that gap or how do we bridge that concern? And if that's not the concern, then we need to clarify what the concern is. So if I'm up here and you're not agreeing with me, that's totally fine. I know we can't dialogue back and forth too much, so I apologize. Um, but how are we gonna land in a place where agree to disagree, everybody's at least understanding the why? And because the how, I think, is the piece that we're not so sure of. The how was the how that's, that's been good enough or that has been more than good enough for a long time, and now it's in question. And again, whether that was the question or not, that's just um, kind of the message that, that I've heard and been asked to, um, to share with you guys. So wherever that goes moving forward, just that level of transparency, right? That level of collaboration, um, what's that gonna look like? Who's that gonna involve? And then to what extent, at some point, um, you know, I, I know that there, um, there's some things that, again, I'm not going to speak to some of the things that some of the other people in the room are, um, but just what does this mean for all things moving forward, right? Right now, the, the context is third through fifth grade science, but there's a lot of other things, right? The irony of the, the conversation last time was that then we heard about high school science immediately thereafter. Um, Bill Kimmel did a great job coming up and talking about that, but you could imagine the concern around our science, our secondary science teachers of what does this mean, right? What is, did we do it the same way? Did we not do it the same way? If we did, why was it okay for, for a high school group but not okay for an elementary group and all of those layers of potential confusion that are out there? Um, so again, lots of questions out there for you guys, um, but that, that's some of the feedback that, that I'm hoping we get clarity on is what does collaboration mean to the board? Because I think we have a good idea of what it means in the ranks across Rockland Unified now. I think we're doing a great job with that. I thought, or we thought, we did a great job of that in working through curriculum. I know that at one point there was concern of there wasn't enough access to parents, so the deadline to make it accessible to parents was extended. Whether that made a difference or not, I don't, I don't know. I know we heard there, we heard that the mention of a handful of comments were left over that time period, but we didn't hear like, were they late in the game? Were they early in the game, right? Did the extension of time matter? Or what's that kind of going to look like moving forward? And then how is that process going to, to be vetted, right? I mean, is it just going to be a, I know it won't, but is it, hopefully it's not an arbitrary decision of just some random um, thought. And I, again, no discredit to you guys. You're much smarter and more professional than that. Um, but that's what I'm going to leave you with tonight is how do we bridge that gap? Because the, the way I left that room and the, and the conversations that came up in the, the weeks since then and now are did we only take one step backwards or do we take a couple steps backwards when we're talking about collaboration? The board supports it. We see the resources, we hear it. You guys love when we get to talk about it and engage about it. We love having you and Rochelle at those, those meetings when we have the steering level. But are we talking about two different elements or versions of collaboration I think is what we're kind of left wondering. So that's my comments for the evening. I appreciate your guys' time. I look forward to the, the answers and clarity that can be provided as that conversation further develops. And, Wish you all the uh, happy last 20 days of this school year. So, and we'll be back together again. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Travis. Can't do it without these. All right, so now on to item 7.1, comments and report from student board representative Bahar Marathi. Bahar, will you please share your report? Thank you, President Hub, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Stock. I'll begin by highlighting events and information provided by a few Rockland Unified School District campuses. To begin with, Parker Whitney is looking forward to their spring band concert and a few field trips this week to Bernard Museum and the State Capitol. Their open house is on the 11th with a food truck, student art show, and student marketplace. On the 17th, their fourth graders will be performing the Gold Buster Dust play. At Sierra Elementary, their sixth graders are in the home stretch of their culminating IB experience working in teams on their exhibition projects. Exhibition is on Thursday, May 25th. Their band concert is May 4th at 6 p.m. In addition, they have been learning a cultural dance aligned to a unit of study in their grade level and will be performing in their Dance Around the World show on the morning of May 19th. 
And over at Sunset Ranch, their amazing PTC spent $500 to deliver snacks to their students who are CASP testing so they will have the energy they need to do their best. Also, this week, Sunset Ranch PTC has planned an appreciation around the world thematic team, sorry, Teacher Appreciation Week. The following week, they will hold their annual open house on May 11th, in which their first graders will partner with Whitney High School Junior ROTC Color Guard to kick off the start of their night. Moreover, Twin Oaks, would, Twin Oaks would like to thank all of the Whitney and Rockland High School students that volunteered for their spring carnival. The event was a complete success, and they couldn't have done it without their help. Earlier this week, the fourth grade students headed to Sacramento to tour the Capitol building and watch Soarin' Over California at the IMAX Theater, while the third graders learned about pioneer life at the Bernard Museum. Also, their spring book fair, book fair will kick off on their open house night on May 11th. Rock Creek is celebrating their hardworking staff this week. Many of their classes are looking forward to a variety of field trips this month, and their sixth graders are getting ready for the sixth grade Greek games on, May, on Friday, May 12th. Their fifth and sixth grade musicians are looking forward to their band performance on May 18th at 6 p.m., and their students are excited to finish out the school year participating in the optional ukulele club and yoga club after school. Furthermore, Quarry Trail celebrated their first ever spring carnival on Friday, April 27th. There were food vendors, bouncy jump houses, carnival games, and a DJ. Quarry Trail's open house will take place on Thursday, May 11th from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. They will be showcasing the art projects from the year, from the, year the Quarry Trail family bricks in the garden, as well as all the great classroom displays the teachers and students have prepared. Their sixth grade promotion celebrate ceremony will take place on Wednesday, May 31st, and the Quarry Trail sixth grade clap out will begin, will happen on June 1st. Over at Breen Elementary, the kindergartners are growing marigolds from seeds and taking care of painted lady cal caterpillars. The second graders presented Rumpus in the Rainforest, and the third graders at Breen have been using their speaking, listening, and presentation skills as they practice for their performance of the Go and Buggy play. Third grade, third grade is also writing narratives, learning more about geometry and reading. Fourth grade had a blast from the past as the students reenacted a day in a pioneer's life by making candles, corn husk dolls, learning to embroider, and participating in a leather making task. Springview Middle School is holding the color run on the 26th, followed by the seventh grade glow rally on the 31st. Also, they will finish off their year with their eighth grade promotion on the 1st of June. Then over, um, from the Rockland Alter Alternative Education Center, the Victory High Interact Club is once again putting service before itself at the May 12th Hooked on Fishing event. Hosted by South Placer Rotary, their Interact Club will be reaching, I'm sorry, teaching students from Rockland Elementary and Antelope Creek Elementary how to fi fish and, of course, have fun in the process. And over at Whitney High School, we just hosted our first ever charity staff basketball game against Rockland that was planned and prepared by the LLS Students of the Year Club at Whitney. We also just had our junior prom last weekend um, on site for the first time, which allowed for lower ticket prices while still creating a great night for the students. And now we are looking forward to our senior ball this coming Saturday. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Bahar. Lots of great things happening around the district. All right, now item 7.2, comments from the board and superintendent. Board members, do you have any comments? Yeah. Um, so thank you very much. The, uh, it, it's great to hear about, I know it's towards the end of the year, as Travis said, we got 20 days left till uh, everything all ends up, I know for those Parents of seniors, you got graduation. Um, for the parents of eighth graders, you got that promotion and all the sixth grade stuff going to middle school is always fun. Um, I've gone to this a couple years now, and if you haven't, and if you can make time, the uh, at Sierra, the IB exhibition is just really, it's amazing to watch and see the kids present the, the topics and the different things. I think last year it was environmental, helping the planet, and just watch the kids, just the passion of here's what we did, here's my project, and, and explain it all. It's just it's a neat thing to see, so uh, parents of Sierra, please get out there. If you have the time, it's just a fun time to go watch and watch those kids present. Um, we were at, uh, I think, Victory High School's, I don't know what the, 
Western Area. I'm gonna, it's WASC. I'm going to ruin this. But. Yeah, Western Association of uh, Schools Thank and Colleges. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So they're going through their accreditation. They had the uh, stakeholder and community meeting. It was just great to see the passion from the teachers, the community. Um, Mayor Broadway was there just to hear about all the great things they're doing at Victory. So thank you for that. I'm hoping that everything works out there and we'll be in a great place. Um, and then earlier today, we had the facilities master plan meeting, which is a great time to see all the work and all the projects. I can say it's good to know that there's no immediate firefighting needs like, oh my gosh, we got to jump on something right away. Um, it's a bit humbling to see that we've got way more projects than we have money for. And I'm, I'm looking at Travis and he's laughing because he, he, he knows this all the time. It's, it's a great problem to have, I guess. We got we to figure out how to make those things work. But uh, you know, thank you to Craig and your team for, for keeping the place working in in good shape. Um, we just got to figure out the priorities and get that. But again, keeping the facilities and, and keeping the campuses up to par, as you all know, it, it, there's, there's more desire than money in the, in the equation, especially in the state of California. So thank you. Thank you, Bahar, for your update. I always love to hear those. I have to say one of my favorite things about spring carnivals uh, is when you're around town, you get to see all the kids with the face paint. <laughs> I know we had a t-ball game for my little guy the other day, and I saw all these kids from some of our local schools with face paint on, and we were just having a blast talking about school and how they had fun at their school carnival, and then they came to their t-ball game right after. Um, so thank you for that fun update on everything great happening on our campuses. Um, I also did just want to give a public update. Uh, the last two board meetings, we've had several individuals come with questions about wrestling and concerns about mats and facility usage. Um, and so uh, very thankful, uh, Coach Perez and Assistant uh, Principal Penny Shelton, I was able to go out, meet with both of them. Um, it was actually the, during the fluke rainstorm, so I apologize to them greatly. Um, but I, I really think it is important to get out and really look at what it is we're talking about and looking at. And uh, we have a phenomenal program. I mean, Coach Perez is passionate about working with those kids. And he was actually setting up for a youth league that he does on his own time after hours uh, to raise funds for the program and I just thought that was phenomenal and I wanted to do a shout out about that and I actually just got an update that just came through a few minutes ago uh, that they're looking at the testing of the mats and we really want to make sure we ensure that um, that our mats are safe that we have the best quality equipment for our students and so just a shout out to both of them for um, allowing me to get out there quickly to really see what's going on and um, transition that into our facilities committee meeting. I know as uh, Trustee Counter talked about, we had our first meeting today. Um, Superintendent Stock, I think I laughed when you said, hey, this could be a four to six hour meeting. We realized about two hours in, I don't know, we were a tenth of the way through what we wanted to get through. Um, uh, but uh, you and your team have done a phenomenal job um, really looking at what are the needs. I know I'm excited to hear, we talked about, we wanna hear from the principal what are their site-specific needs. Um, so we're looking forward to hearing that. I know it'll be a process, um, but uh, from what I already saw, I saw great consideration to many, many needs and concerns I've heard from parents, I've heard from teachers, I've heard from staff members, and I saw them already on that first document. So uh, looking forward to the continuing uh, discussion on that. Um, I still couldn't believe uh, when we said Whitney High is almost 20 years old. I just, that went by so fast and is aging me now. Um, but uh, we do take uh, not just regular maintenance serious, um, but also we want to make sure we have the state-of-the-art facilities for our students and our staff. So thank you to everybody. I know that's going to be a process, Craig. Um, I appreciated uh, every question we had, you had an answer to right on the spot. So thank you for that. And we look forward to making sure we have the best facilities possible here at Rockland Unified. Thank you. Okay, well, you guys took a couple of mine already, so. <laughs> um, I also was there with um, Trustee Counter at the WASC, one of the two WASC meetings at Victory High School, which I did write it down, Western Association of Schools and Colleges, and I have learned a lot about this. It is a very big deal for a school and for the students who go there and being able to go to college and come from an accredited school, and so, the teachers were there speaking to how they work with students and help support them. We learned about their mental health supports. We were able to hear from community supports um, and the activities that they do to keep them engaged. And it was just very impressive. And that whole community there and the way that they support each other, um, I can't wait to spend more time there. 
Um, I also was able to go visit Whitney High School and take a tour with Principal Collins and with Assistant Principal Shelton to look at the facilities, look at the mats, talk to them about the process and how, how these things get purchased, how these facilities work and how they work together to share resources. And so I am very happy to hear that um, we are looking into the safety of the mats and um, I think this has been a really positive experience to get some of this conversation going. Um, also, I went to the Rockland Elementary 5th and 6th grade band concert on Tuesday. My 5th grader, Adair, was performing, and it was so fun. It was a great group. that You see them all sitting there, kind of getting all their wiggles out, and then all of a sudden they put together this very well-coordinated show. And it was a wonderful send-off to Robin Ritchie, who is the band teacher and is retiring this year. So that's what I have. with um, Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, I just want to give a shout out to all of the teachers of our district. They for sure deserve to be appreciated. This month, especially, I think May was a great time to uh, make Teacher Appreciation Week because teachers are out there working on getting their classrooms ready for open houses. They're working on their report cards. Um, a lot are working on state testing. Um, in the upper grades, there's senior balls and graduations and end of the year testing and report cards and all of those amazing things that happen in the month of May. And I hope that our families are making the teachers of our district feel very, very appreciated because I know they're working late into the night and on weekends to get everything done. And then from the well, 10,000 foot level, um, I was able to go to Washington, D.C. last week with the um, California School Board Association. It was a coast-to-coast -coast, uh, meeting, and it was very, very educational. And I think two things that I brought back that I think um, our teachers and staff would like to hear about. Um, one, we focused a lot on special ed funding and how to improve that. Um, we spoke to several congressman and the education committee about approving um, uh, higher funding for the special ed um, programs. And then the second thing I know um, CTA is working on along with CSBA, and that is um, changing the laws in California around um, teachers being able to get Social Security in their retirement years. So most people don't realize teachers don't get Social Security. Because teachers have their um, state retirement, um, it's considered double dipping. So in California, teachers have not been able to get any Social Security benefits, even if um, their spouse dies they don't even get their spouse's social security benefits. And a lot of teachers, um, teaching is their second career. So they've worked many, many years um, in the public and can't, can't get the social security for that. Or after retirement, they go to work in the public. And one of the things that we really pushed on that is our teacher shortage. A lot of um, people who may want to come into the teaching profession after retiring from another profession won't do it because they'll lose their social security benefits. So a lot of progress was made there, um, not just by CSBA, but by other organizations as well. And it really does look like that is going to have a positive ending. I, I don't have any dates on that, but it looks like it's going to um, go through. The education committee is very receptive and working hard on that. So um, hopefully, that will be uh, soon um, as we have teachers retiring and um, wanting to get those benefits, but also um, attract teachers into the profession. So happy Teacher Appreciation Week, and um, that's it for me. Uh, Superintendent Stock. Um, I just, I think as we talk about teacher uh, appreciation, we want to also acknowledge that our, our board president is a teacher, and, and I also, mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, know that it means a lot, uh, given having my wife and my oldest daughter being teachers, and so uh, we acknowledge teachers wherever they ser serve our kids, and, um, and, and so we so appreciate that. Uh, there's a, a few items just, just to follow up on. I think first I want to start with our, our student trustee. So, uh, Bahar, could, could you update the board on where your plans are for next year? Because we know May 1st was the official college acceptance deadline. 
But um, can you tell folks where, after all your time in Rockland Unified, you are well prepared to attend where next year? I'm going, I'm going to Harvard next year. <laughs> So, so, but I would like to add, I just told him, Trusty Counter, I'll forever be a wildcat, but <laughs> roll crim. <laughs> uh, so, so we're, we're, we, one, just want to extend our congratulations to you and your family and, and, and frankly to all your teachers and everyone else that helped assist you, but you did the hard work along the way, and, and so we, we think that you're a fine example of, of what Rockland uh, students can do, and we look forward to uh, the amazing things that you'll do for not just our community, but for our whole country uh, in the future. So, um, but, but that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is a great example of what Rockland Unified students can accomplish, and uh, Harvard's nice, uh, as though as a UC Davis Aggie, it's, 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 it's okay. <laughs> Um, but I, I would um, also like to just uh, uh, also acknowledge a few other pieces, um, is that uh, the report you heard uh, from uh, uh, Travis uh, Moje on, on the uh, collaborative efforts, I, I won't recite them. He did a fam fabulous job. It was very appreciated to be invited to the site rep council meeting um, and, and to be able to you know, hear firsthand their thinking and their thoughts and appreciated the, the honest conversation and then um, it was also great to have, have him there with our principals and, and I to hear their honest conversation. And what's really great is as you really take the time to listen, you find that we're all really kind of working to solve the same things. And, and I won't recite all the other work. He did a fabulous job. But one of the big benefits is the ability for us to work together to collaboratively solve problems. And an example of this is that this Friday we're taking a deep dive for about half a day into trying to figure out how we can address uh, the decline in average daily attendance because one, we have a phenomenal program every day and we want our students there to take advantage of it. And the other r r reality is our funding is based on students showing up. In excused absence, we don't get funded. So we wanna dive in deep together um, to think about what are ways we can do to improve attendance. So that's an example of joint problem solving um, to try to solve issues that this collaboration leads to that may not have always been there, but us diving in deeply to data, to the metrics, getting in, talking into attendance clerks on the ground and just figuring it out together. So those are opportunities that, just frankly, we may not have taken before, but. Are, are, are those ongoing joint problem solving areas. And then if, if you didn't hear it, elementary back to school night at 12 local locations next Thursday. So if you're curious about what elementary education looks like, you can find one at any of 12 locations. Um, but we are also very grateful to all of the things that our community does to help our students have a phenomenal uh, close out of the year. And you heard all those events that Bahar listed all those things are, are help supported by not just phenomenal staff that go above and beyond, but our, our parents and our community. And you saw the Granite Oaks family honored, but every single one of our schools has that type of support there. And, and, so, and we're so grateful to that. And, and that's really what makes our schools so special and makes those memories for our kids. So um, that's uh, my report this evening. Awesome, thank you. Item 8.1 is the consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are to be considered routine and will be enacted by one motion followed by a roll call vote. There'll be no separate discussion of these items unless the Board of Trustees, audience, or staff request specific items to be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action. Any items removed will be voted upon following the motion to approve the consent calendar. Does anyone wish to remove an item from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items? So moved. Okay, first by Trustee Sutherland. Second. Second by Trustee Counter. George, will you please call the roll? Bahar Maradi. Yes. Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Sadoff. Yes. Rochelle Price. Michelle Sutherland? Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. Motion passes. All right, item nine. Action on resolution 22-23-31. 
final resolution to reduce or eliminate classified school services for the 2023-2024 school year. Dr. Tony Limoges, Associate Superintendent of Human Resources. Thank you, President Hupp. Uh, board, this is part two of the least favorite job of a human mm -hmm. resources. Um, we started with March 1st, as which I shared, and there's lots of great dialogue and questions over the preliminary notices. <clears throat> as we shared before, there is a, a statutory deadline in um, May 15th, and so these are the final notices. But I do want to highlight for the board that, uh, you know, based on previous openings that we had, the ability to get uh, other individuals that were on the original uh, the layoff list, uh, different positions within the district based upon retirements, based upon new openings, based upon transitions, you will notice this list is much more uh, truncated than it was originally presented in the preliminary notice. So I'm just going to kind of uh, read from there now. So based on the current budget and reductions of particular kinds of services, the district will be using final reduction and forced layoff notices to employees. <clears throat> Issuing notices and making other reductions will provide the district with maximum flexibility to meet its financial obligations for 2023-2024. Again, this 9.1 is exclusively classified uh, school service employees. So the recommended action is it a motion to approve resolution 222331, final resolution to reduce or eliminate classified school services for the 2023-2024 school year. Any questions or comments? <clears throat> Just a comment, just to say, you know, I know we've had dialogue about this. I thank you um, not only for answering our questions in the past, but also working hard to try to make sure this is as least impact as possible. I know right-sizing districts is never fun. Um, and so I thank you again for taking the time to work really hard uh, to try not to have to make cuts unless absolutely necessary. So thank you. Is there a motion to approve resolution 222331, final resolution to reduce or eliminate classified school services for the 2023 2024 school year? So moved. First by Trustee Sadoff. Second. Second by Trustee Sutherland. I'm <laughs> Sutherland, sorry about that <laughs> counter. <laughs> Your voice is really deep, Trustee <laughs> Sutherland. Uh, Georgia, will you please call the roll? Bahar Murati. Yes. Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Sadoff. Yes. Rochelle Price. Michelle Sutherland. Yes. Julie Hupp. Yes. Motion passes. Dr. Limoges, will you continue with 9.2 action on resolution 22-2332, final resolution to reduce or eliminate particular kinds of services pursuant to Education Code 44955? Yes. Thank you, President Hupp. So 9.2 is just a continuation except for certificated employees within the district. Um, March, the March uh, statutory deadline, which used to be in the past classified and certificated. Certificated was only with the March and May um, statutory deadlines. Now, based on um, the Senate bill, it has been aligned to go together. So they will now forever in, in our time be kind of on the same train track. Um, as you will notice, there were, um, I want to highlight, there. this has also been truncated as there was teachers that were added to this. There was much spirited dialogue in regards to that during the March 1st uh, board meeting, but we were able to find a placement and or for all the teachers that were on the original layoff notices. So I'm certain there may be some questions, so I'm gonna just read and, and ask for the motion. So I'm asking, recommending an action, motion to approve uh, resolution 222332, final resolution to reduce or eliminate particular kinds of services pursuant to education code 44955. Okay, comments? Questions? Yeah, so I, I guess with this one, just to, sure. to help understand the, the pieces, we had a specific org structure pre-COVID, correct? And then with COVID additional funds that came in from the state and federal, we modified given the challenges there. Yeah, so um, just in anticipation of this, this was a dialogue that we had during the March 1st board meeting um, and uh, my esteemed colleague, Dr. McDonald, did prepare some information, but I'm certainly glad that you will be asking some kind of public questions to give Dr. McDonald opportunity to uh, present some more specificity because he oversees the health services unit. Dr. McDonald, you can, from the dais or wherever you prefer. I would love to share the dais with you. <laughs> yeah, 
Good evening, Board of Trustees. Uh, Trustee Counter, so prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, we did have a, a health care structure for the district that had one health care uh, health services supervisor because of the increased demand due to COVID-19 and the, the amount of calls and health care. You remember, you all, some of you lived through it. It was tough, but we did add a second health supervisor with one-time funding, and so that is the position we're talking about this evening. Just a follow-up question, then the, the future uh, org structure, how, how it how it, how, I guess, how it aligns with the district. There's other changes, I guess, I think at a lower level. District. Yeah, so we, we recognize that um, the landscape has changed a bit. So we have um, significantly more health needs coming in for students in terms of diabetes and other pieces, health, uh, vision and hearing screening. So we're proposing on the augmentation list to increase uh, health aid hours at the site level in terms of providing longer hours, so and that's direct contact with students, so we can better meet those needs throughout the day. Right now, we have part-time people largely at the sites. And I just want to say thank you for that clarification. I know at the March meeting there was some concern, some parents had shared, even some staff um, asking um, for us to kind of do a deeper dive. I know since then you were able to provide to the board some internal documents about um, really, really the great work that you are doing in areas that we are looking at increasing health services, um, but it's just a different model than this actual position was really meant to be. So thank you for that clarification and thank you, Trustee Counter. You actually hit my questions because um, I know sometimes we get information, but I want to make sure the community hears as well. I thank you for taking the time to put all that information together for the board. Anything else? Okay, is there a motion to approve resolution 22-23-32, final resolution to reduce or eliminate particular kinds of services pursuant to education code 44955? So moved. First by trustee counter. Second. Second by trustee Sutherland. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Bahar Marathi. Yes. Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Sadoff. Yes. Rochelle Price. Michelle Sutherland. Yes. Julie Hupp. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Now to item 10.1, Hannah Anderson, Director, Innovation and School Programs, to present the Local Control and Accountability Plan. Good evening, President Hupp, trustees, Superintendent Stock. I am here tonight to share our update of the 2023-24 Local Control and Accountability Plan. We are in a refresh uh, year, and so we have been working uh, with our educational partners to look at our current plan and what we want to keep around um, for future years and what uh, potentially needs some augmentations in the 23-24 school year. During the presentation this evening, I will share about our LCAP development process and then review the proposed goals and spend quite a bit of time with you on the actions and services this evening. Um, many of the metrics will be highlighted in the presentation today but are also shared in an attachment. And at the end, we'll discuss next steps. As shared previously, uh, this new version of the LCAP allows for increased alignment Many of the times that trustees and the community have heard about the LCAP, it actually has not been with me standing here. It has been with our classroom teachers and Beth Davidson and her team sharing with you about the work that is actually happening within goals one and two across the district. Uh, this new format of the alignment, I, I'm sorry, of the LCAP has allowed for increased alignment and it has also allowed for us to engage more deeply with our educational partners in the development of the LCAP. So we are not just gaining input on the LCAP during LCAP advisory sessions, although I truly appreciate those sessions, held two of them yesterday, and, um, and uh, had um, Trustee Sutherland able to attend one this year. Uh, we, it is an ongoing um, opportunity for us to hear from our community and our teachers in those sessions. It is also great to be able to hear directly from teachers on our mass steering committee, uh, and in our workshops, as well as hearing from students this year in the workshop, which will also all be brought into the development process. 
Over the course of this school year, we have heard uh, from trustees and hope to again hear your input tonight as we go into the final draft process, which will be done later this month. We have um, conducted our annual LCAP survey, heard from students in student forums as well as through panels, one of them uh, here during a workshop, had an opportunity uh, to uh, hear from our mass steering committee as I shared previously as well uh, as we will be hearing from our professional development committee. I believe we meet with them next Thursday. Uh, all of that will also be brought into this plan. We have had the opportunity to meet twice with our staff advisory committee and have another uh, meeting for them later this month to take a look at the draft plan. The same is with our parent guardian advisory committee. Our district leaders have also been um, helping us in the development of this process and will be coming together next week, as well as advisory committees that are representative of many of the students uh, who we are directly focused on in this LCAP development process, which is our English learners, our foster youth, and our socioeconomically disadvantaged families, including um, our students living in homelessness. And finally, we also are required by law to consult with our SELPA. We include um, in all of our committees um, representation of our students with disabilities. We will also consult with our SELPA as required by uh, Ed Code. We are proposing no changes to the current uh, goals that uh, exist in the LCAP. Um, in this year's plan, we're proposing no changes for next year. Just as a reminder, the first goal, I don't know how you would, uh, uh, anyone would ever forget this. We've had the opportunity to talk about it quite a bit. But uh, uh, our first goal is around math improvement and continuously improving, trying on a small scale and then bringing um, things uh, to a large scale of changes. You'll hear a full report on this from Director Davidson on the June 7th board meeting, but I am um, prepared to answer questions um, related to the LCAP this evening. Goal two is around uh, behavioral supports and social emotional supports for students. And goal three uh, is everything else that makes Rockland Unified a great place for students um, to grow and develop. We, and a great place for staff to work um, and families to live. We have all, um, all of the services um, within Goal 3 we look to maintain and monitor, and you'll hear about a few enhancements this evening. This slide shows what we have heard from our educational partners, and you'll see a couple of these slides in the presentation, so I'll take just a second to share. The upper left-hand corner of these uh, slides show what uh, most current data is showing us, um, that we, a piece of most current data related to this goal. The bottom left of this slide is showing you what we've heard from educational partners previously. The right-hand side is what we have heard and where we will continue to add um, from what we are hearing from our, our students, our staff, and our families this school year. Uh, I've received some feedback from our families and our staff specifically that they appreciate um, seeing this slide because it helps them really solidify what, they're, what we're hearing from other educational partner groups and then they know what to directly look for in terms of augmentations or additional services for students. So just um, our, our data in the goal one area is showing high results for all students. We continue to have uh, persistent gaps, although we are making progress with our targeted student groups. This year, input received has been that elementary staff report the need for increased training in curriculum and instructional strategies related to mathematics. Our staff report that the learning recovery program has been critical for them in terms of making progress towards closing achievement gaps. The staff also report the need to close gaps early in our elementary years um, instead of waiting for gaps to widen in later academic years. Our secondary staff and parents report the, um, the effectiveness of our everyday math program and the need for continuing services there. And just yesterday, we were able to collect additional information and, and we'll be gathering, um, staff is working to gather all of that information and add it into the draft here this month. So uh, uh, our students, again, continue to perform in the high area. This is the snapshot of the California School Dashboard. Um, within the dashboard, we have some groups that outperform the all student group. Across the state, our, uh, the state of California is unfortunately, all students are in the low category. And so Rockland Unified continues um, to shine in this area. However, we know that we have students for whom we still need to do work. And so <coughs> any of the students who are two achievement bands below the all student group 
we need to specifically address in our LCAP. And so you can see our students in the low category, our, uh, our African American students, our students living in homelessness, our socioeconomically disadvantaged students, and our students with disabilities. We need to ensure that we're targeting our improvement efforts towards these students in our plan. And you will see um, the interventions uh, on the services slides, those interventions, we ensure that these demographic student groups are represented um, uh, in a significantly proportionate way in these groups. And we ensure um, specifically that the unduplicated students um, on this list, so our, our socioeconomically disadvantaged students and our students living in homelessness actually gain priority access. They are looked at first to register for any or to be selected for any of our interventions or, or extra academic supports um, before we were to place any other students. Uh, this metric is one of our progress monitoring tools. It is measuring and, and a benchmark towards a goal you have all set, a five-year goal. And so this is a three-year version because LCAPs are three-year plans. It becomes a little bit um, um, difficult to um, measure against both. However, what you're looking at here is that uh, we have a progress monitoring goal that we use uh, measures of academic progress, the MAP assessment. We've shared um, previously that we made gains with our all student group and what we've seen historically is in the all student groups it can be variable by about a percent where we want to where we want to talk um, to this evening is the specific areas that we have uh, focused our work in the last two years it has been in uh, in our intervention programs uh, in our uh, learning recovery program at both the elementary and the middle school, targeting uh, intervention curriculums, providing additional training to those intervention teachers, and we're starting to see progress towards closing gaps um, in those areas. Some um, students have made more significant progress than other students, um, and so what we are in the process of doing right now is, and, and Director Davidson will speak more to on June 7th, we're in the process of identifying which of the small scale trials have been the most effective so that we can broaden um, those, the impact of those trials during the next school year. And then we also will um, be planning to take steps towards uh, addressing the all student group in a more rigorous way uh, in the upcoming year. And she'll share more deeply on that. All of the services targeted towards math improvement included in our LCAP, and, and just as a reminder, in our uh, local control and accountability plan, we speak to our supplemental dollars that our district received, those supplemental LCFF dollars that are targeted towards supporting those unduplicated students, socioeconomically disadvantaged, including students in homelessness, English learners, foster youth. We also uh, intend to be very transparent with our community about how we are spending all of our dollars aligned to LCAP actions. And uh, throughout the LCAP, you can actually see where our dollars are focused towards each action and which service, and that is those supplemental dollars, all of our LCFF-based dollars, all of our federal funding, um, and any dollars that are not aligned to the LCAP, then the budget overview for parents at the very beginning of the document actually will share um, which dollars weren't included. And so um, that's a, a step above and beyond that Rockland takes that isn't required by EdCode to do, but uh, brings alignment and, and shows the investment uh, that trustees are making in this goal. Um, goal one, um, the services, just to highlight a few, we will be continuing our everyday math um, sections that um, there are more than six sections uh, at, of everyday math at the high schools, but we have added uh, six sections through this process, so we'll be sustaining those next year. We will also sustain uh, targeted tutoring for our foster youth and our homeless students. We'll sustain the efforts to um, develop and modify common assessments. At the elementary level, those were developed last year and are in a, uh, a refresh process this year now that we've been through a year of implementing them, what's been working, what hasn't been working, and so the um, MTSS team has been working together with teachers at each grade level to identify what types of changes they would like to see moving forward uh, with those common assessments. And then our integrated one teachers have been coming together this year to 
um, trial common assessments in our integrated one courses at our comprehensive high schools and we'll be ready to move um, into the other integrated courses next year. Expanded services that we will be continuing are listed here on this slide. We uh, will continue with our learning recovery program. However, we're going to be modifying it uh, in year three. So this will be learning recovery 3.0. It really will be where we're shifting from more of a learning recovery model into a, um, a tiered supports for students model, an MTSS model, right? Learning recovery was post pandemic and now we really need to get into what students needs can be met in the, uh, in the base classroom, right, with their, with their teacher providing first instruction, which students' needs can be met with their teacher providing intervention services, which students' needs are going to be met maybe in a separate pullout service, um, and which students' um, needs reach the level of needing that additional layer of support within special education. So you'll see that shift um, over the next uh, year with the implementation of this plan. So you're seeing a um, few less uh, teachers there, but you, what you should know about our learning recovery plan for next year is that the teachers will be targeted at our highest needs schools, and so and that includes our Title I schools at the elementary level. At the middle school level, there will still be um, a 1.0 math intervention teacher at each middle school. And then, um, well, we'll hear about that during school three. We also are expanding, as you heard in our uh, Expanded Learning Opportunity Program presentation, our summer school program, and we are planning to continue, um, actually bring back, we previously have had data support at our elementary school sites. With the learning recovery teachers, we've been able to phase that out a little bit, and now there will be two schools that will get back some data support because they will be um, having a learning recovery model that won't include a certificated teacher. And that's Quarry Trail who's been doing that this year and Rucola Elementary School. They'll be using a different model where their current, uh, Rucola has a current learning recovery teacher. They'll be going back to the classroom, um, and then they'll be kind of that lead of that program and helping to support the instructional aides um, who will be continuing to, live, to deliver the interventions. Okay, we are looking at a few budget augmentations within uh, our math improvement efforts. We um, don't anticipate being able to do each of these augmentations. However, these are three that we have been engaging with our educational partners on and, and felt appropriate to share with you this evening and hear your interests as well. Um, we are looking at increasing our site supplemental budgets at our elementary and middle school sites to provide more local control for our principals and their leadership teams and school site councils um, to make site-based um, decisions about interventions in math. These dollars um, typically currently are used for um, providing aid time um, to run interventions or to monitor um, classroom instruction while teachers are providing interventions. Also, we um, use these dollars to um, supplement uh, curriculum and we can use these dollars for software programs that are purchased at the local level. The other um, options that we're looking into are the acquisition of math intervention curriculum, we've been trialing a um, building fact fluency intervention elementary, so there may be some needs there to increase what types of um, interventions are necessary to fill skill gaps at particular grade levels. And we're also looking to increase opportunities for professional development in mathematics, specifically for elementary teachers with general education credentials. And we also have our uh, integrated one and integrated two math teachers um, reaching out to the MTSS team for a request for training as well. Moving into goal two, we uh, have heard significant input from our educational partners this year related to social, emotional, and behavioral services, um, uh, specifically in the area of mental health. Um, as you uh, have seen, our data shows an increased um, need uh, for, well, our, that our students are showing increased chronic sadness um, and that. Uh, and that we are also seeing as students get older in our system, those rates of sadness are increasing. And as our students um, get older, their optimism rates are decreasing. And, and again, this is not a problem that is unique to Rockland. Both goal one and goal two are really addressing um, issues that we're grappling with in the state of California and throughout the country. Uh, I, I am proud of us um, for working together to try to solve these very lofty 
um, challenges, and actually that was um, mentioned by a few of the parents that were with us last night, that they're um, appreciative that we are working hard towards these big goals um, and, and maintaining focus in these two areas, even though we haven't, um, even though, you know, we have not found the golden ticket yet for everyone to um, be social emotionally well, right? But we will continue to work at it. In this area, um, staff have reported the need for integrating social emotional learning in addition, um, in addition to explicit skill development. You heard that. Um, parents and guardians report the need for clearer communication regarding access to services. Staff are also reporting that. Um, parents and guardians and staff report the need for ongoing training in this area. And that was again echoed last night. Um, parents and guardians uh, and staff report the need for increased mental health services in our elementary schools, and you'll see um, that uh, trustees have already approved additional counseling time that's now included in the LCAP. And staff report the need for help coordinating these social, emotional, behavioral um, services and professional development. Over the last uh, three years, the percent of stu uh, parents and guardians agreeing on the LCAP survey that their uh, student feels safe at school has been increasing. Um, we, are, um, we have risen uh, a little over 5% um, since the 2021 school year. Great progress on that uh, indicator. We also um, shared this in a disaggregated way at the update in February. But in the area of behavior, we are having students who are having a, a more significant behaviors coming into our schools and staff reporting some um, less uh, supports to be able to address some of the behaviors they're seeing or that um, those tiered supports and interventions, um, they don't know what those are and want the opportunity to be able to access those for students. We see that at the elementary level, this has dipped slightly this school year. We see that at the secondary level, that um, is a need for us to um, continue to work with our secondary schools and thinking about how do we address this area. So a few of the highlighted services here, I will not read them all to you. Um, obviously, continuing with our secondary counseling, we will increase our elementary um, counselors, so each elementary school next year very excitedly will receive two or three days of counseling support. So what we trialed at our Title I schools this year, next year will be um, for all of our sites, and then our Title I schools will still get a little bump on top of it, which is excellent. Um, continuation of school-based therapy for our secondary schools, um, continuation of breaking down the walls at our secondary sites, and then we will also plan um, to continue and expand our family um, education series. Uh, we are in the middle of a um, Teaching with Love and Logic series that is um, in an eight-week series that is going on right now in consultation with a local um, business owner, but also who is a member of a um, community organization we've worked with previously. We also had a community organization put on a parenting teens session uh, earlier in the spring, and, um, and our coaches put on an amazing parent university um, with um, local partnerships as well in Wellness Together and um, law enforcement, and as well as our USD staff presenting. Uh, expanded services that we're looking to include next year is increased communication regarding those available services, sustaining uh, a behavior analyst that was hired mid uh, or that was um, put in place uh, mid year this year, um, sustaining that mental health funding for the mental health specialist at Victory High School. Um, you heard uh, one of the students during the student forum mention um, the access and availability uh, to Taylor Gaffney, our mental health specialist at Victory High School, doing excellent work. And she also is available to help our highest needs family across the district. And then um, our plan to sustain invest the investment in Care Solace. We intend that that investment in Care Solace will continue to be grant funded for the next school year. We also, um, we also, believe that our mental health specialist at Victory High School and those high need supports will also be grant funded. So those will not be part of our LCFF supplemental dollars, which is very exciting. Um, potential service augmentations in this area is to look to increase staffing at our high schools by one section per comprehensive high school. This would help our high schools coordinate and plan for integration of social emotional supports on their campuses. Uh, we also, uh, are looking at, and again, wouldn't be all of these pieces, but this is what we're out in the community hearing um, 
hearing input on is the potential of increasing by 1.0 um, instructional coach or some other type of um, uh, coordination of supports um, for central coordination, coaching, and professional development for social, emotional, and behavioral initiatives. So this would include um, social, emotional learning, mental health, PBIS, substance abuse prevention. So someone, instead of it living on a lot of different people's desks, thinking about how one person focuses on that. Um, could be an option, and we were just interested to hear um, what our staff and our parents had to say about that. We are also looking at an adjustment of noon duty and discipline tech ratios to increase, and by the way, noon duty is yard duties. Yesterday we had some good questions about that, and so they are yard duties at our elementary <laughs> school and middle school sites. Um, so we're looking to um, adjust those ratios to increase supervision throughout the day. And then also expand breaking down the walls so our middle school students have access on an every other year basis to breaking down the walls. All right, jumping right into goal three. Um, as you, uh, a highlighted version of goal three is that we're looking to expand transitional uh, kindergarten programs, bring in another three, uh, it, it, the window expands by another three months, so we're almost to the full implementation. We'll be there two years from now. We are um, going to continue offering three sections above the ratio at each of our comprehensive high schools for credit recovery. Um, we are also looking to sustain the increase of our ELD courses at Whitney High School. So this year we added on the first day of school a section of additional English language development at Whitney High School to support our um, English learner students. Next year, we are looking to trial a, uh, another section in the form of a learning center type course for our English learner students who are at the beginning levels of language acquisition at Whitney High School. So if you are new uh, to learning English, you will get your English language development class, and you will also get a learning center class taught by the same instructor who's received specialized training. The intention there is that students um, need English language development, but in order to graduate from high school, they also need to be able to pass their classes and make progress towards graduation. And so our intent with this trial course is it models um, what uh, other districts around us are trying instead of all students being together um, in a class for all the core courses, a support course may be more of what we're looking for. Um, and so we've um, been working, actually Sarah Sores, our coordinator of ELD, has been uh, working with the Whitney High School team to develop a model, and they'll be trialing that next school year. We are also looking to sustain our English language development teachers at our elementary schools this year, um, mid-year, to um, support the need um, for increased uh, students new to the country within the last year. Uh, we added staff in the middle of the year. We will sustain that staff and also add an additional um, point four, so another two days a week of ELD staff. Um, at the elementary level next year. And then we are looking to continue um, to support our, our students new to the country, that's that newcomer EL students. Um, we are looking to continue to support them during our summer school program. So we will have that um, offered this summer and um, we plan to continue that um, as long as we see these high numbers of newcomer students. Goal three, we have many uh, opportunities to celebrate. Um, our progress as a district within um, within this maintenance goal. Many of our uh, many of our indicators within goal three have already met where we would anticipate to be at the end of the three year plan, and many others are are on track. So just a couple to highlight for you. Um, we intend to maintain um, or increase our graduation rate. We have met our three year goal in that area. We um, plan to increase our students meeting A through G requirements. We have met our goal in that area and are make, making significant progress towards closing achievement gaps in this area as well. Um, we plan to, we are on track to meet um, the percent of students completing career technical education pathways and on, tr uh, on track to meet our goal of uh, eliminating barriers for students to enroll in AP courses and so increasing therefore the number of students who are able to enroll. We are on track in that area, and we are also um, proud to maintain our high status of that English learner progress indicator. That means we're reclassifying students uh, at a rate that is um, typical within that two to four year span, and um, 
students who are reclassified in Rockland Unified typically outperform our English-only students. So not only are we reclassifying them, but they are doing quite well. Okay, so additional services for our English learner students within the LCAP. I've spoken about many of these a few slides ago, so I'll just highlight that in addition to English language development, we also have targeted tutoring for these students. We'll also be providing uh, math professional development, bless you. Uh, bless you, to support students, um, to support teachers, excuse me, in delivering uh, non-linguistic approaches in mathematics, breaking down those language barriers for students so they can target um, their math improvement, and that we will continue having our family liaisons. That's been a, a, a welcomed addition this year, our uh, liaisons at the elementary and secondary level who can support our English learner families um, in um, building community with their schools. For our foster youth, whoops, I'm gonna go back and just share. Um, this means we have about 535 English learner students currently uh, as of publishing this last week. We have been uh, about five students have been moving into the district roughly um, each week. And we also have um, a projected investment in our supplemental funding of 1.3 million for these youth next year. It's a little over a fourth of the funding and they make up about a fourth of the supplemental students. Um, our services for our foster youth students and students experiencing homelessness. Um, we also provide these students priority access to our learning recovery courses and targeted tutoring. They have access to be able to check out Chromebooks and we're going to be partnering with a, a new hotspot um, a company next year um, that actually will provide devices where they'll have access to social services and other local organizations that we choose right on their device. Um, I'm eager actually to collaborate with a few of you on local organizations and that we could put on our devices. Um, we will continue to provide case management to eliminate barriers. We are doing that this year through either myself or Taylor Gaffney at um, Victory High School who can support our students in homelessness and their families as well as our foster youth. And then we will continue our uh, foster and homeless youth advisory committee and having a district liaison who works with all of our site-based liaisons. This year, cumulatively, we've had about 158 students in our investment. Um, many of these initiatives are now grant funded, so this dollar amount looks lower um, than maybe it has in past years, but that is um, not because we are investing less. We are actually investing more resources um, in these youth than we ever have before in the district. Okay, our services. Um, for foster youth and homeless youth expanded. Um, this year we had our first ever back to school fair targeted towards these youth. So we will uh, continue that in August and we will make sure that we uh, send out invitations on this as an awesome opportunity to welcome uh, families to our district and uh, think about ways to um, break down barriers for them. We had um, previous English learner students there acting as translators and able to help families, um, as well as our, as our uh, paid translation services, but they were there to help our families filling out their data confirmation um, for our families living in homelessness or our highest needs socioeconomic disadvantaged families. We had, um, uh, we had hygiene kits available and also all of the school supplies they needed and all of their, uh, uh, all of the access to community organizations and Rockland Unified employees so you could get your information about nutrition services and transportation services and technology services in kind of a one-stop shop and pick up all your back-to-school supplies. So pretty awesome, we'll continue that. And we also um, will uh, continue our site-based liaisons and our, um, and our consultation with Placer County Office of Education. They really are our right and left hand um, in supporting these youth and we will continue to work with them. So next steps in the development of the LCAP will be to continue the implementation of current actions this, during this month of May, as well as continuing to work with our educational partners to refine our draft actions and services for the 23-24 school year. We will finalize our supplemental expenditures this month in alignment with LCAP actions and, and publish a draft. We will continue utilizing feedback from these advisory committees to make changes. And so after that draft goes out, our advisory committees will have another opportunity to share input. And then I will be back on June 7th for a much shorter presentation um, to share with you um, what is in the final plan um, and to present for a public hearing as well as I'm back on June 21st um, 
for uh, board action and approval alongside the budget. And with that, do you have any questions? Thank you so much. That was very detailed and well organized and found that I'd note something down and then, oh, yep, she, she's got that covered. Okay, keep scrolling. Um, I did have a couple of questions. So you had talked a little bit about the learning recovery supports and how most campuses use the same model, a couple campuses don't. So I'm wondering, with the increase in counseling days at all of the campuses, Will the service delivery for counseling and behavior supports be a standard protocol across campuses, or will each campus be kind of doing their own model based on their needs? And if it's different, will that impact how we measure progress? What we have been able to trial in the Title I schools this year is a model that we're looking to replicate across the district. And so with two days a week or three days a week, they're able to devote um, at least one day a week of services for one-on-one -on -one supports. So making sure that there are still at least five or six one-on-one -on -one sessions for eight to 10 weeks um, sessions available to students. That's a model that we would want to ensure um, continues. The other space can be used for social skills groups it can also be used for um, push-in supports into classrooms, helping out on the playground. Sometimes it's running um, an additional more structured recess game for students who um, maybe actually have been seen kind of in a service session with the counselor, but are able to then apply those skills out on the playground with the help of a supportive adult um, or in a structured game. So it will look uh, very similar across all of our schools. Each school um, has a request for assistance form as part of their, um, each of our elementary schools has a request for assistance form as part of their positive behavior interventions and supports, PBIS tier two teams. That, inter that um, referral process is how, um, and through the classroom teacher, um, is how students gain access to a lot of those services. Okay, thank you. Um, just the other question I had was related to the new instructional coach for the social, emotional, and behavior initiatives. So what um, will that time look like that that coach is spending, and who will they be working directly with? So first I want to make sure I was clear in that this is an augmentation that we that, that we're discussing with different groups. So nothing that is officially in the plan yet and just something that we are looking at as a way of saying maybe, uh, maybe one way to improve in this area is to ensure that we have dedicated someone's time to the coordination of this. We have had a coordination action since we started this three-year plan, mm -hmm. but it's lived a little bit on a lot of people's plates instead of having one dedicated person. And so we, okay. are, we have not fully designed exactly what that day would look mm -hmm. like, but we intend that they are able to spend their time thinking about the coordination of social emotional services, mental health services, into our um, PBIS systems in our K-8 schools and Victory High School, and then also um, through the integration of um, uh, the models that are being used at our high school settings. Um, we have, ha we have trialed homeroom at one of our high schools. We know that they're looking to trial something else. So we really want them, this person to work alongside the site social emotional learning teams and help each of the schools think about their implementation plan and support by cultivating resources, professional development um, opportunities. We would like this person to participate in networks and communities of practice with practitioners from other districts and bring in best practices, just someone who is hyper-focused on this work and thinking about how to move it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Anna, first, thank you. Uh, the LCAP is no easy task, <laughs> right? I think there's a reason we have similar goals for three years, right? And then we start the process again. Um, but to see the evolution of this, thank you uh, very much to you and your team. Um, I just had a couple items that came to mind as I was looking through the presentation. Uh, slide six, 
Uh, always important, great to see this slide um, that we're hearing from our educational partners of what they're requesting, what they're asking. I did notice on there a bullet point um, that secondary staff and parents guardians report a need for increased everyday math classes. Um, and I thought that was really important to highlight. Um, but my question surrounding that is, do you anticipate that specifically being the everyday math model? Um, or I know Whitney High shared with us a model they were piloting. I believe they called it a co-teaching. I call it double teacher model, where essentially, right, you're, you're lowering the class size by having two teachers, or the ratio, I should say. Um, and they were showing us some data that that was really successful. And I know that was a, a, a really early pilot when we did the study session. But we were kind of comparing the two models. Are we specifically looking for the LCAP at just investing in the everyday math? This is where having, uh, trying to truncate into slides. So okay. that's that what should I thought it be, might be five sections at Whitney High School of everyday math and okay. one section at Whitney High School of the dual teach. Okay, so we do model. plan to so keep So they it. are going to continue because they have seen a, um, success with that model there at Whitney. Great, that's what I thought. So I was like, wait, are we not using? No, 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 the data just looks so great when you shared it with us. And I didn't know if there was a reason staff and parents were specifically wanting that other model. So great to hear. I know not everything can get squeezed on these slides. Um, and then there is so much good information. Slide 19, I just wanted to bring one point. Um, so many, so many great percentages on that slide, right? I mean, we've talked about that many, many times. You compare Rockland Unified to the rest of the state. I mean, our graduation rates, our A through G readiness, we always want to do better because any percent less than 100%, right? We wanna make sure every single child is doing the best they can and having the best outcome. Um, but I, 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 I still wanna kinda just, um, put like a little emphasis on the CTE. I know you hear me say this all the time, you're probably not surprised. Um, but I do believe uh, we have students and we want them all to be A through G ready. Um, but the reality is we do have students and really in that homeless foster youth area um, that they're, they're, they may not be going away to a four year university. I would love to see us really focus that goal three in the future on increasing students completing CTE pathways. And if that means um, adding additional pathways um, or even maybe including in that or supplemental to that dual enrollment options. Um, I think that's a great option for students um, that maybe don't have the support to go away to a university. Uh, today I was at a city event um, where Sierra College spoke and they were just speaking out about some of the phenomenal things that they provide and in specific a foster homeless youth program and a grant that they provide for students. And I just caught myself thinking, man, let's highlight those dual enrollment opportunities and give these students um, really a viable path that they might transfer in two years to a four year. Um, but let's maybe focus um, on some of those areas where we're still seeing gaps for those students. Maybe a focus more on CTE for them might be an option for them. But thank you. I know that's the intent of this info item is we kind of get to share with you our desires. Um, so I'd love to see that kind of highlighted a little more. But thank you very much for all your work. Thank you. So th thank you very much. I know that the, the journey is long. You're going from... 2019 when we started and, and and thank you for showing the metrics. Thank you for showing the history I think it's important to show the community like we're on track or we're hitting we're hitting goals. We're, we're doing good things um, I know the social emotional piece wasn't in when we originally started so it's great to see a little bit of a flex there when it comes up and Taking a slight twist putting the effort behind it and uh, and changing a little is a good thing given that we're hitting a lot of the metrics and doing the great things. So again, thank you for all this. Uh, looking forward to seeing all this come to fruition and then, and then we start again, right? Hannah, thank you so much. <laughs> all right, item 10.2, we'll ask Communications Chief Sandeep Dosange to present the communications update Good evening again, board president, trustees, and superintendent Stock. So tonight we would like to provide you guys with information on efforts we are doing to raise awareness of our um, exceptional programs that we offer all of our students and families. 
So as you're aware, Rockland Unified offers a variety of options for students and families to choose from when they select what works best for them and their children. Tonight, we will discuss these programs. So the Department of Communications and Community Engagement works with each school and program coordinator with the goal of making sure all of our educational partners are aware of the options that are available to their students and families within our schools and by showcasing the programs as much as possible. We also are committed to increase enrollment in all of these programs of choices and these efforts do align with the board's goals to increase choices and options for families and to make them aware of their options. And it also aligns with the school district's mission to provide high quality education for all students with the overall goal of making sure we have graduates that are productive members of society once they leave Rockland Unified. So let's look at the metrics. We're working for continuous improvements in all areas, including increasing enrollment in all of these programs. So in June of 2021, the IB program at Sierra Elementary had an enrollment of 434 students. After some promotional efforts, we were able to increase enrollment by 44 students to 478 students, which was um, from October 2021 data. However, in October 2022, the enrollment did drop down to 447 students, and the um, current enrollment as of April 26th for the upcoming school year is at 426 students, but we still have time to do additional outreach and raise awareness and for our families at Sierra College and faculty to let people know that um, our programs are open at Sierra Elementary. Over at Rockland Elementary School, we have the self-contained gate program, and it begins through grades second through sixth. In, uh, in June of 2021, we had 99 students enrolled, and by October of 2021, we increased it to 140. And then for the current school year, the enrollment was flat at 143 gate students, and in, um, it's currently flat for the upcoming school year. But keep in mind that the capacity for the self-contained gate program is about 145 students. So currently for the upcoming school year, we do have a wait list in some grade levels. So the new Spanish dual language program at Corey Trail Elementary School began with 70 students for transitional kindergarten and kindergarten grades. And next year, it'll expand to include first grade. And as of last week, enrollment for the dual language program was at 118 students. So the junior ROTC program at Whitney High School, it's, um, it's a school district program that happens to be housed at Whitney High School. And as of June, in June 2021, the enrollment was 88 students, and that number did drop to 66 students by October 2021, and it remains flat this school year. So there are hundreds of students enrolled in our career technical education programs at each of our high schools, our comprehensive high schools. However, the following numbers show the students that completed the three course sequence of CTE students. So CTE completers at Rockland High School rose from 100 students in June 2021 to 164 students in June of 2022. Over at Whitney High School, CTE completers in June 2021 was 150 with 181 students in June of 2022. So keep in mind this school year, those numbers won't be available until graduation. And um, we won't know um, next year's until June 2024. Okay, so the following programs, I, I wanna preface this as saying that we in the communications department work closely with the schools and the program coordinators to determine what type of support they need, if any, from the department. Because they separately do their own outreach to build awareness about their programs each and every day. 
So we're gonna take a closer look first at the Interbaccalaureate Primary Years Program at Sierra Elementary School. So since the production um, of the original IB video in May of 2021, it's been used on the district's website and the school's website. It was also used to educate the current families at Sierra Elementary as well as prospective families and it's shown during parent information nights, back to school nights, and open house. So in the, the first video was produced in May of 2021 and in the summer of 2021 we did a social media campaign which resulted in increasing enrollment by 44 students as was shown in the previous slide. At the end of last school year, May of 2022, we did a video refresh because the health mandates were lifted and we um, decided to refresh in it and then we um, did remove the old video so the, the current and refreshed version is currently up on YouTube, the district's website and the school's website. So. Um, before any type of social media campaign or increased outreach is done, um, my department works, works closely with um, the school principal, Ms. Westberg, um, Ms. Johnson, the program coordinator, as well as Dr. McDonald in elementary services department to determine if further promotional efforts are needed. So now we're going to the self-contained gate program at Rockland Elementary School. So this video was produced this school year in January and it was a very quick, it was actually pr produced the last week of January with a very quick turnaround so the school could use it in a parent information night um, a couple weeks after that. And um, the video is also used to share with families of current first graders that qualify to be Gates students, so they could learn a little bit about the program before enrolling their child into Rockland Elementary School. The video is also shared to all Rockland Unified first grade teachers and all elementary school front offices, so they're aware of um, the information about what Gate is in the self-contained program at Rockland Elementary School so they're best equipped to answer basic questions that families that might be interested may have. And my department continues to work with the gate coordinator, Sarah Soares, to determine if additional um, outreach is necessary that we could help with. Okay, so the Spanish dual language education program, obviously it's a new program that Rockland Unified offers. We did produce um, two videos, one in English and one in Spanish. And both videos were produced in the fall of 2022, and they um, are on the districts and the schools' websites. They're used um, in parent communication that the school pushes out to increase enrollment of Spanish-speaking students and families so they could consider enrolling in the, um, the program at Cory Trail Elementary School. Um, they plan to use it um, beginning next school year at back to school night, but they did use it in January at Fiesta del Año Nuevo. So I do want to highlight that um, through um, our efforts with the Rockland Educational Excellence Foundation, we did secure funding for a few videos, including the Cory Trail videos. Okay. So, it lets me go to the next slide. So now we wanna talk about the Air Force Junior Reserves Officers Training Corps, more commonly known as the Junior ROTC program at Whitney High School. So I don't know if you guys saw the video yet, but it's phenomenal. Um, so, is the video, so are the videos from the other few programs that we already talked about. But this video was produced in, um, March and it was, um, you know, ready to go to inform educational partners about this program at Whitney High School. And it's actually the only junior ROTC program of its kind within Placer County. It's very important to mention that. So if you know anyone that wants to transfer from a neighboring school district, um, the likelihood of those transfer requests being accepted are very high because it's a unique program. 
You can do that online, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So the video is also on the schools and the district's websites and will be shown at community events such as the Rockland's 130th anniversary historical and cultural celebration at this Saturday from, three to, from 4 to 8 p.m. at Johnson Spring View Park that we will also have a booth at as well junior ROTC program. So currently this school does middle school outreach. They go to Sunset Ranch Elementary School and they promote the program with um, different activities that cadets would be doing during um, their time in the junior ROTC program. We also do plan to partner with the city of Rockland in promotional efforts in their newsletters that they will be sending out within the next few weeks and also with youth, youth sports to raise awareness about the junior ROTC program. So um, as of Last week, Thursday, my department launched a social media campaign on both Facebook and Instagram. And since launch, we um, have reached about 5,000 views with over 2,000 post engagement and 145 people clicking on the link that goes directly to the Junior ROTC's website on um, the district's homepage or district's website. Okay, so career technical education, Trustee Sadoff, this is for you. So um, we're committed in promoting our exceptional career technical education programs. We do have 17 different pathways in um, our high schools. And through the generous contributions from the Rockland Educational Excellence Foundations, we were able to produce three different CTE videos. One is a general umbrella RUSD CTE video that um, provides snippets of both Rockland High School's programs as well as Whitney High School's programs. And then we also, ha also have CTE video for Rockland High School's pathways, and then the third one of Whitney High School's CTE pathway programs. Okay, so both Rockland and Whitney High Schools have been showcasing their programs during showcase nights and also at middle school events and during each high school's back to school nights. We also um, know that the school counselors at the high schools also use uh, materials uh, to promote the CTE programs for incoming students or students that might be interested in joining a CTE pathway at their school. And um, currently, we are busy editing promotional videos, 17 different videos, to showcase each individual CTE pathway. So all programs have a video that they can use to highlight what students will receive when they do select that pathway and when they complete it, hopefully completing um, the whole CTE programs courses so we get those numbers um, increased from their current that Hana showed in the previous presentation. The last portion um, of this large CTE project should be completed um, by the last day of school. Clearly I'm having technical difficulties. So we're going to the next steps here. So um, we'll continue to work with the schools and the program coordinators to determine how the communications department could continue to assist them with ongoing promotional efforts to raise awareness about these programs, these options families have within Rockland Unified. And we'll continue to find new ways to highlight student educational excellence and how our teachers and staff support each student during their journey throughout Rockland Unified. We'll continue to monitor enrollment numbers within these programs and at all schools and adjust our efforts as needed. And we'll also look at ways we could partner with Rockland Chamber, the City of Rockland, Placer County Associations of Realtors, and community and service organizations to find ways that we might be able to tap into their outreach that they already have just to promote what we're doing and the great stuff we're doing each and every day for our students and families. That's all I got. All right, so. any questions or comments? So, I get, so thank you for this. The, the videos, the, the ones that I have saw are amazing. Uh, they're, they're really cool. The, um, the one thing I would say for the, for the older parents in the group, are these connected to the websites also, or is it? 
Yeah. Just because you send yeah. people, hey, go take a look at it, and you yeah. can help. Yeah, so uh, the CTE videos are located at rocklandusd.org slash CTE. Um, and or, at the high school sites? Uh, and um, they're also on the Whitney and Rockland High Schools sites. The individual programs will be, if they haven't been already, then I'll double check and make sure that they will be within the next week or two. And then um, all, of our, all of our program of choice videos are located on um, the school district's YouTube channel. Um, but we'll, we also um, plan to um, include them on our Facebook channel. Right now, um, the our Junior ROTC video is up and going. Um, it's very powerful and moving. Um, and then um, we'll just make sure that all of these videos are on all of the websites and the school websites as well. You know, thank you for the intentional outreach, Sandeep. Um, and specifically, um, in the area of CTE, I was not aware we're doing an individual video for each one. So 17 videos by the end, like yeah, in 20 so, days? So we um, initially um, interviewed the teachers, and then we got video footage of all the programs. And then we went back, and we also interviewed um, students from each program. Because um, most effective are the student voices. We know that very, very well. So um, the editing project is a big one. So it should be wrapped up soon, um, hopefully tomorrow, but I doubt it, because um, it's, a, it's a massive feat. That's quite the undertaking, and it was a nice surprise to hear. Um, I, you know, we say often we have so many programs that are the best kept secret, and I'm excited uh, to have that intentional outreach so people know uh, what's available to them. So thank you for all this great work and for, again, that intentional outreach um, of some of our community organizations. I think that's great. They, they serve our families as well, and the more that we can collaborate and work together and send out the same message, uh, the better, and it's a win-win uh, for both of us. Um, and then also just outreach to those foster and um, homeless youth too, yep. um, them understanding that these are um, some pathways that they can join too. Uh, thank you so much for the great work on this. I, I don't expect you to have those videos done in a couple weeks, um, sure. but, but no, <laughs> but really, I, I truly do want you to hear. Uh, thank you very much for doing that. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Sandeep. Uh, watching those videos, they're amazing. They're very high quality, very well done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And so now we'd like to show the audience all 25 videos. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have now come to the part you've all been waiting for, public comments. Um, so if you would like to make a public comment, please turn in one of these green cards to Sandeep over here. Um, when you come up to the podium, when I've called you up to the podium, please state your full name, the city you live in, and the school your children attend. All comments must be addressed to the board. Please make sure you're facing the board and addressing the board. The first 10 people, and we have quite a few comments tonight, so the first 10 people will be allowed three minutes each, and each person after that will be given one minute per person um, on the item they're speaking on. The board is not permitted to deliberate or take action on non-agenda items, but may refer the matter to a staff member for follow-up. Comments must be respectful and professional. Please no profanity. I will do my best to pronounce everyone's name correctly, and I will tell you who's up and who's on deck so you can prepare yourselves. Please keep an eye on the clock. I know that's difficult while you're looking at your notes, uh, I'll let you know if your time is up. Up first tonight, we have uh, Isabel. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. <laughs> On deck, sorry, is Ava Messing. Um, my name is Isabel Von Seipler. I am a senior in high school and a former student of Rockland High School. At the beginning of my senior year, I was physically attacked by a white Whitney girls soccer player on the Rockland High School campus. 
My attacker was able to attend school, no issue, after it was all said and done. However, I, on the other hand, was facing a pending expulsion, multiple rounds of questioning and investigations, and ended up being out of school the first month of August. During this time in August, my mother and I were told to come back and talk to Rice Rockland High School administrators time and time again to discuss the details of my attack in order for the administration to decide whether I should be expelled or not. During these meetings, Principal Stewart and Vice Principal Stedman talked to me and my mother as if we were second class people who had no idea or interpretation of what they were talking about. I was told that my self-defensive actions were animal-like, and I was told that I was a danger to Rockland's campus. Throughout this time in August, even leading into September, when I was finally let back into school, I was receiving multiple text messages from Rockland High School football players. These text messages were degrading, misogynistic, and sexually vulgar. I sat in my room crying, reading these messages in a group text, embarrassed and begging for this nightmare to be over. I alerted the school of this and hoped something would be done. However, because of the fact that these football players were white and played football, no action was taken to discipline them for this bullying on behalf of my attacker. Because I kept reporting the wrongdoings of these people, retaliation from, from the principal Stewart and the administration carried into my senior basketball season. Head coach tried to prevent me from being captain after four years on varsity and being the leading scorer, revoked my starting position, and then when I had a panic attack about her embarrassing me in front of the whole team, she accosted me in the bathroom, made me feel as though I couldn't leave, and then told me there were ways I can earn my spot back. Rockland High School and its administrators are racist, misogynistic, and will do anything to protect each other and its people like a cult. Rockland High School is even willing to collude with convicted federal felons on behalf of my white and racist attacker in order to ruin my future and force me out of the school. I've stood by having to be silenced for far too long. I participated in this district's fake investigation and have decided enough is enough. You all have sat by and let this happen. Just to be clear, this is only the tip of the iceberg of what I can say in the amount of time given to me today. There will be more Rockland High School girls coming forward, and the truth will be out. Thank you. Thank you, Isabeau. And something I forgot to mention, but you did a good job at, we uh, won't mention staff names when we come up to the podium. I appreciate you sharing your thoughts and concerns, but let's not mention names when we're at the podium. So I have now uh, Ava, and on deck will be Julia Bray. My name is Ava Messina, and I am a sophomore at Rockland High School. In November of 2022, I took part in a sexual act with a fellow sophomore. During this act, I was filmed without my knowledge. He further victimized me by distributing the video to teens throughout the county. I am not the only girl he has filmed, but I am the only one willing to speak up. I will not be silenced. I firsthand saw this boy's collection of videos and photos of at least 50 different girls. I came tonight to speak about my experience since this illegal act has occurred. In a matter of months, I went from being a well-respected, high-achieving student athlete to a student that is categorized as a school slut. In a, our culture, in our school culture today, many girls will do sexual acts for the popular guys in order to maintain their social status. A few of these girls who have been involved in similar situations have approached me since I spoke up. They have shamed me for exposing him and question why I didn't let it go. Each day, I suffer severe anxiety in a way I've never before at school. I live in anger due to lack of justice. Many of the outrageous rumors are often started by his friends in order to try and gain vengeance. Every day since I spoke up, I have felt silenced at my school. Every day I have been harassed by my peers. Not only has the school atmosphere shamed me for this, but I am also constantly bombarded socially outside of school because this video has reached many other schools. Not only was I socially harassed, but it was taken a step further by students coming to my home and vandalizing it twice. Yet another event the school said they would look into and nothing came of it. For months I have felt powerless and as if I spoke up for nothing. I have to suffer the consequences while he lives his life holding his head high. I want to know why he is respected and I am disdained. The answer is that he's a male football player at Rockland High School and the next quarterback. One of the other personal attacks I have had relating to this was our senior quarterback telling my brother he was going to rape me in his truck in the school parking lot. He threatened to assault me and goes on being a big guy on campus. He was not suspended for threatening to sexually assault me. Again, I am silenced. I have even had teammates on my own softball team for the high school defending the male student and speaking down on me. It has become a living nightmare. I cannot escape these students who try to dehumanize me on a, on a daily basis. Over the past five months, I have become 
increasingly depressed, I have increased my dose of antidepressants, and I have struggled with severe suicidal ideations. Because of this event and the justice that has not occurred due to many, many empty promises, I have become very hopeless. I am bullied and re-victimized daily, and my school is not protecting me. I am failing three classes when I used to have a 4.0. This has made me lose my spark as a person. I no longer have the energy or courage to put myself out there or really be a part of anything school-related. Due to this, I am now considering transferring schools next year. I am being pressured out of my school while he is revered as the next star quarterback. I hope that by speaking up, I can create change that the girls at my school will become aware of the predators that lurk on our campus and run down our football field. I hope to never see another girl have to experience something of this gratitude and be treated the way I am. Thank you. Thank you. Up now is Julia, and next will be Mia Messing. Um, my name is Julia Bray, and I attend Rockland High School, and I live in Rockland. Hi, my name is Julia Bray. I'm Ava's best friend. I'd like to share my perspective on the situation regarding Ava to you all. I will start by the fact that almost every staff member watches many girls in the similar situations to Ava's get glared at and made fun of at school, over social media, and even to their faces, but continue to put it aside. I watch as my best friend gets mocked and mimicked all around the campus every single day. It hurts for me to see that people attend the school and still support him and his childish friends every day. A circumstance like the one we're discussing here is very serious and it seems to me that it's absurd that we have known for it for so long and we're still discussing it. People spread rumors that add to the deteriorating environment at the school that has put her in. Not only do people tease her and post stupid rumors, they online they continue to praise him after all that he's done he committed an illegal act as a minor why is he being praised why does he have four division one offers the fact that the police and all the staff at this school have more than enough evidence to prove him to be in the wrong it seems absurd that we're still discuss discussing this topic i'm tired of watching the staff at the school ignore the situation and let him walk around and act like he didn't commit an illegal crime because he's a starting quarterback Issues like this continue to happen in our generation and people continue to ignore them because they're just kids or they have too much potential and we can't ruin their lives this early. Yes, you can. He chose to take that video that day and not tell her. He chose to send it out to people. That can never be erased. And that will live in people's phones from now on. The fact that so many people can sit here and watch this happen is ridiculous and it pains me to watch my best friend have to go through such a horrible situation. Let's not forget the last year's quarterback saying he's going to rape Ava in the back of his truck and all that was done was a small talk to him and maybe a few hours of detention. He should have been suspended for at least a week. The fact that he still goes to our school and hasn't been expelled yet is crazy. Do you want a criminal on your campus? Personally, if I were in your shoes, I wouldn't want that kind of child on my school campus. But of course he gets to stay because he's a football player. You all will, you will do just about anything but suspend a football player in trouble. So many of those boys on that team have done a large amount of hurtful things that continue to be ignored. Call our school football school, but hiding behind all those athletes are rude and selfish kids that need to grow up. I hope that someday this will make enough of an impact for it not to happen to anyone else. What he did was an illegal offense and should not be praised. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is that right, Mia? Am I saying that right? But Mia. It's Mia Messina. Messina. Not okay, thank you. And then up after Mia is Rosalinda. Perfect. Hi, my name is Mia Messina, and I am Ava's sister. Before this event, my sister was a bubbly, outgoing kid who was a proud supporter of all her fellow athletes at Rockland. Unfortunately, since this crime occurred, my sister has not been extended the same kindness and support, and is by her fellow athletes and is bullied every day by students that this school idolizes solely because they are football players. She goes through school every day in fear of running into this perpetrator in the halls. It is astonishing to me that even as the, school as the school's top pitcher for the softball team and a model student, she is seen as lesser and not a priority when she is being harassed and bullied by these students. Clearly stated in California's Education Code 32261, the legislature hereby recognizes that all pupils enrolled in California state public schools have the inalienable right to attend classes on school campuses that are safe, secure, and peaceful, and my sister is not receiving that. Why is this individual still able to walk around on the same campus as my sister is baffling? And to allow this to continue is not only a disgusting misuse of power by Rockland High School, 
but a violation of my sister's rights to a fair public education, and we will not stand by and watch this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Up now is Rosalinda, and after that will be Valerie Chapman. Hello, board. Uh, my name is Rosalinda Seipler. Um, I am, live in Rockland, and I have four kids, three of which attend Rockland Unified School District schools. Some of you are familiar with a physical altercation involving Isabel that she described last summer. A fight Bo did not initiate, but she certainly had the right to defend herself. The incident was, has unfortunately unspiraled, spiraled into nine months of discriminatory, unjust, unfair, and isolating actions by Rockland High School administrators. Against Isabeau, and I have shared all these incidents with most of you in email communications. Bo was initially suspended for three days and extended to five because her father would not meet with Davis Stewart. Bo was missing school, so I quickly said, yes, I'll meet with you. Uh, the Whitney student that initiated the fight uh, did not receive any sort of punishment. She punched my daughter, and it's seen on video. She was not suspended, not expelled, and enjoyed her first day of school as a senior. Uh, and before I even had the first meeting with the Rockland High School administrator, um, there were email and phone communications going on with the principal of Rockland High School, and it was the parent of the other student that attends Whitney High School. I was assured in a meeting on September 30th that that would never happen. However, I have the email, and that person was CC'd in that email. New education laws were passed in August of 2021 regarding suspension and expulsion practices by the California Department of Education. An abundance of research has shown time and time again suspensions and expulsions do more damage than good, especially among marginalized groups such as African American students and Latino students like my daughter. If that were not enough on Bo's plate, incidents of harassment, cyberbullying, social media on and off campus were taking place and targeting Isabeau. And these were by other Rockland Unified School District students. All these incidents were reported to both Whitney and Rockland High School administrators. Through the Catapult reporting system, emails and phone calls and videos were uploaded. We found out very quickly the athletic code of conduct only applies to certain RUSD students. RHS football players are exempt. RUSD zero tolerance bullying policies also only pertain to certain students. RHS administrators shielded preferential students, especially male athletes. This is a dangerous practice by RHS administrators, creates a toxic culture that does not protect our female Rockland High School students. Aside from managing school operations and staff, I feel principal's role is to counsel students provide a safe and productive learning environment. This has not happened at Rockland High School. Uh, our daughters are not safe, and both of mine have been removed from Rockland High School. Your role as a school board member is to ensure that the students are Thank you. Up next is Valerie Chapman, and after Valerie is Jake Messina. My name is Valerie Chapman. My daughter, Ava Messina, is a sophomore at Rockland High School. I'm a 21-year veteran classroom teacher, and tonight when I sit in a boardroom, I think about how much the system that I've dedicated my life to as a public teacher has failed my child. And it disgusts me that every day when I get up to drive to North Highlands to teach children and give my best, that I feel more safe and secure than my own daughter does at Rockland High School. 
it's wrong, and I can't be quiet anymore. I first became aware of my daughter being bullied by members of the Rockland High School football team in January of 2023. The administration also became aware of this at that time. The quarterback for the JV team filmed my daughter in an intimate act unbeknownst to her, and he then distributed that video to the football team and other teenagers in the county. This student has a gallery on his phone. His phone has been taken by the police with a search warrant. On his gallery, he has pictures of over 50 teenage girls. For the past four months, my daughter has repeatedly been verbally and electronically harassed by Rockland High School students, specifically the football team. Each day she's on campus, she does not feel safe and her mental state is fragile. I am texting her throughout the day for her to give me a number rating of how she's doing so I can decide if I need to pull her from school that day because it's just too much for her to handle. After becoming aware of the bullying and harassment, we went to the campus SRO to press charges against the student. The charges are possession and distribution of child pornography. The police served the search warrant for the phone and the case was sent to the DA in February. My daughter is brave enough to come forward and expose this student, but after bringing this information to light, she is being bullied even more. This boy goes around campus bragging about his football offers, showing everyone on social media what he's doing and what his next steps are. When my daughter can't even think what her next steps are that day. I sit here tonight and I think about how I'm listening to the school district talk about mental health concerns and social emotional wellness and student safety. And my students' mental health and safety is completely disregarded. I have not received one phone call from the principal from the superintendent, from the assistant superintendent in charge of Title IX, and I have watched my daughter become silenced at Rockland High School. I've watched my daughter degenerate over the past four months. She's gone from a 4.0 to now failing three classes. At lunchtime, she hides in the library because at lunchtime, the football players were throwing garbage at her. A few times that she's also slept on the floor of classrooms just to avoid students. She's on antidepressants and attends therapy weekly. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you. Thank you. Up now is Jake Messina, and after Jake will be Courtney, and Courtney, I'm sorry, I can't read your last name. Shaman, maybe? Shannon? Courtney Shannon. My name is Jake Messina. My daughter is Ava. I live in Rockland. I'm an employee of the Roseville Joint Union High School District. I'm a 24-year veteran of education. I'm a 24-year veteran of uh, varsity and college football coaching. And I'm currently a teacher and the head football coach at Oakmont High School. My daughter was filmed without her consent during an intimate encounter with a Rockland football player. That same player has sent many images out, including to some of my own players. She's been bullied and harassed. Her mother's house has been vandalized and ultimately has been made the scapegoat in the possible demise of the Rockland football star. Even some of her own female teammates have joined the fray simply to stay in the good graces of the football players, as pathetic as that is. That this individual who is clearly and admittedly guilty of distribution of child porn, there is no question here, still participates in football activities without a care in the world, 
is a direct indictment of the entire system. It tells young women that crimes against them are secondary to winning championships. He is so brazen in his disregard for my daughter's mental state that he went as far as showing up at the hometown thrown down and standing behind her dugout as she warmed up. We had to ask him to leave, and there were no admin present at a school-sponsored event attended by at least 1,000 people off-site. We moved to this town to give our kids a small town environment with great athletics. I felt that the barrier had declined in that sense. However, I will say that something of this nature would never have happened in Sequoia Union. I have certainly been told by my principal and my assistant superintendent that this absolutely would never happen in Roseville Joint. Luckily today, as evidenced by the presence of the SACB and my long conversation with Joe Davidson, who I've had a relationship with for many years as an athletic director and a coach, the eyes of the world far outside of the Rockland bubble are focused on this issue and the greater culture of anti-female victim shaming at Rockland High School. My sincere, my sincere suggestion to anyone involved in leadership in this district is to take a hard stance today against these behaviors. I'm gonna leave you with this. George Patton was the greatest general in the history of the United States. And even Dwight Eisenhower eventually had to walk away from him because he would have cost him his future presidency. I really urge you to take a hard look at some of the people that you're employing because they are going to cost you greatly. Thank you. Up now is Courtney, and after Courtney will be Alicia Watkins. Hello, everyone. My name is Courtney Shannon, and I have right now four daughters that attend your guys' schools of Rockland High School, Springview Middle School, and Rockland Elementary. My husband and I dreamed of Rockland 10 years ago, and we made that dream possible two years ago, and we regret it. We have moved here and had nothing but issues with your high school. Nothing. It has been the worst. And I feel so disconnected and so scared for my children that my children will not go to Rockland. They will be transferred to Whitney or something else, and it will be approved. I pay my tax dollars and own my house here on a dream that we regret, and it's, it's sad. And I've met these parents, and I see what they've gone through, and I feel for them. Unfortunately, they have it way worse than mine, and I'm here today just as to be not only an advocate for them, but an advocate for my daughter. Because unfortunately, Rockland's staff, administration, and athletics department is a cult. They sweep everything under the rug, and I don't know if you guys allow it, but it's gonna stop because the voices are starting to be heard. My daughter is a basketball player there, and she was told by a teacher how stupid that is. She was told by a teacher how stupid we are to take her out for three days to go to a tournament. And as this came to your administration, it came to the fact that this teacher and I had to go face to face in almost a physical combat. And this went under investigation for you guys, and all I'm told by your district, Murphy, is to keep it quiet, but she'll get consequences. I'm not gonna keep quiet anymore. Then she went to basketball this season and was benched. And I'm told by your athletics director that if I go to the district, I'm only hurting my daughter. Aren't you supposed to be there for me? I have all the emails from him and I'll be sending it in this week. That's high school play. Oh wait, this is high school. How in the world did an African American lady basketball coach lose her job last year? I think all of us wanna know that because she stood up for our girls. Your academics don't mean anything at a rate of nine anymore. Your ethics are killing our kids. And it's time that you guys step in and get a change before one of these children take their own life because of what's going on. And it's gonna be on you guys. And these parents have my support, my emails and more. They may have not gone through what they're going through, 
but the discrimination against these female players is bad, and your staff is taking another look the other day. So your, your boys team and your golf events, bringing your funding, they can't bring that funding for the female players, so then you show the image of the company. Coach, you have one question now. Alicia Watkins, and after Alicia will be Wendy Beal. Thank you, board. Thank you, everyone who appeared. My name is Alicia Watkins. This is the speech I had prepared. I put a lot of work into my speeches. I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. I've survived two suicide attempts. I've survived drug use. I've survived bad relationships. I put my own father in prison. So when I can tell you I can barely hang on to my emotions because there are teenage girls in this audience who have been abused and maybe some of you knew about it and coaches knew and teachers knew. And there's a representative from the Moms of Liberty in the back of this room who love, love, loves Jim Jordan who's affecting our schools and helped put some of you on this board. Do you know how shameful that is? Can you look at yourselves in the mirror and realize that you are costing children their lives with bias, narrow-mindedness, and not addressing abuse? I, um, I don't get emotional at these things. I come up to make a statement. I came up to address why Greg Farrington's Destiny Church is hosting the AP testing for Rockland High School since he's obviously anti-LGBTQIA+. I came up here to address why certain people from his church go onto your high school campuses, but the landing spot was kicked off of campuses because apparently it's too controversial to have a queer pastor be a peer for queer children. That's what the speech was. And then I hear about this. I hear about this hashtag me too infinity. My God, are you serious? So um, I run some social media sites called The Voices of Placer across Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. If you want to be heard because you're being ignored by every fucking person that is supposed Language, to please. be listening to you. Language, please. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. I, I am trying so hard not to cry. But if you want to be heard, come to my site message me, we will work on getting you heard if the people who are supposed to be taking the reports and addressing this are not listening and are not doing anything because their football team is more important than the lives of young women. It's 2023, and we're dealing with this in America. All of you do better because I promise you, you will regret it if you don't. So now is Wendy Beal, and Wendy is our 10th speaker. So after Wendy, it will be one minute per person, and next will be Jesse Nibley. Can I um, just ask the board because I am not a resident of this city. So I'd like to give my three minutes to a residence and I'll just take a minute. Is that possible to do? You want to just have the next person go? We can have the next person go. Perfect. Jesse Nibley, go ahead and come up. Hi, thanks board for being here. My name is Jesse Nibley. I have three kids in Rockland School district one is not old enough to attend yet but um first of all this is not my topic but i want to commend the students who stood up tonight and advocated for themselves and i just think that is incredibly brave <laughs> i 
I don't want to detract from anything that they're saying, um, but I want to speak on something different. Um, that is that I am frustrated and disturbed by this board's decision to reject the Amplify Science curriculum over the unanimous recommendation by teachers. The teachers in this district are well qualified. I trust them with my children's safety and well being. And clearly, since I send them to school every single day, I trust them with my children's academic education. I hope I can continue to do that at the high school level. I'm a little nervous after hearing all of that. Um, I trust the teachers to decide, with a period for parent review, what curriculum to use in their classrooms. And that is what happened here. There was a pilot program, a period for parent comments, and then a unanimous recommendation by those teachers. Um, all of the comments submitted by parents overwhelmingly favored adoption. And the decision to just not adopt a curriculum at all because in the board's estimation, parents weren't involved enough is just inconsistent to the point of absurdity because now what you'll have instead of a unified curriculum that parents can examine, you'll have individual teachers putting together their own curricula piecemeal and using their own time and probably funds to do it. Transparency between schools and parents is better served by adopting an actual curriculum. I watched the recording of the last meeting where I saw this board rely on the comments of just four people in deciding to throw out the years-long efforts of dozens of district staff and teachers to select a modern science curriculum. At any point in this process, the board could have advocated for more parent involvement instead of waiting until decision time and then throwing away all of that effort. Communications from the district told parents that this curriculum was being piloted, that comments would be solicited, and that this board would vote last meeting on whether to adopt the curriculum, presumably on the basis of those comments and that pilot program and the teacher recommendations. That pilot program and the recommendations and the comments favored adoption, and yet this board came in and made a last minute change with no warning to parents. That felt like a bait and switch. It is not transparency, it does not foster trust. I serve on the PTC board at my children's school, and we're trying to raise funds for supplemental science education. Mystery science is not a, an actual curriculum. Oh. Thank you, Jesse. And now we'll hear from Wendy Beal, and after Wendy will be uh, Leslie Cheshire, and these are the one minute time frames now. Good evening, board. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, I also want to commend the young ladies in the audience and um, listening to their stories is heartbreaking. I have confidence in this board that you all are going to take action, that you're going to look into this. I truly believe in this board, um, and I am grateful and um, thankful for you all. Um, I also had a speech, and just my heart is heavy. Um, the one thing I do want to say, and not to take away from anything that's been spoken here, um, that I am concerned about is administration, um, of this district has given personal information from sign-in sheets. Um, and I would ask that the board look deeply into this and um, do some research on what's going on with that because that's personal information that shouldn't be handed out to others. Thank you. So now is Leslie, and after Leslie will be Allison Abbott. Uh, my name is Leslie Cheshire. I am the parent of a second and first grader at Parker Whitney, um, and I live in Rockland. Um, I'm just frustrated and disappointed in the board's decision to um, reject the Amplify Science curriculum. Um, the teachers who unanimously voted for this curriculum um, had, um, had, unanim sorry, had unanimously voted for this curriculum. Um, in the last boarding, member, several things were stated um, is the reason why this curriculum was voted down. One of the reasons for the decision was lack of parent involvement. It seems to me, sitting here, that there's a lot of parent involvement, not necessarily for our program, but for everything going on in Rockland. Um, this decision um, 
was a lack of a survey and disinterest in the parents uh, because these parents, not because they have disinterest, but because they trust their teachers, because they have that respect. And when you hire somebody, you expect them to be an expert in their field. And that's what these teachers have done. Um, I believe. Thank you very much. Up now is Allison Abbott. OK. So then we will move to Sierra Ton. And after Sierra will be Michael Maldonado. Good evening. Um, Sierra Ton, I'm a second grade teacher and a parent of a student at Twin Oaks. Um, first, I'd like to thank our Rockland staff and teachers who went through the extensive and laborious adoption process and in making decisions along the way, because any adoption we do is not done quickly, easily. It is a difficult, lengthy process that we've poured an extensive amount of time, energy, and careful consideration into for the best interest of our future students. As a teacher who piloted this curriculum in 2020, I can say that despite our unfortunate interruption of COVID, this was one I could not wait to implement. I continue to modify the curriculum for use during distance learning and use the piling kit over the past many years um, with my students. And it's been amazing to see them get excited about science and demonstrate strong critical thinking and scientific skills. Amplify simply outscored the other curriculum that was previewed, and the second choice was far inferior to this one. Unfortunately, what happened during the last boarding meeting was that we were removed, we as teachers were removed from the community, and it was a cancellation. Thank you. So now is Michael Maldonado, and after Michael will be Erica Carlstrom. President, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stock. My name is Michael Maldonado, Placer County resident of 25 years, Rockland resident since 09. I'm here tonight because I put in a PRA, which came back with minimal results, even though it was very specific. However, there was one outstanding item in the PRA reply that I take issue with. There was a breach of trust with Associate Superintendent Bill McDonald. In an email which was not given in full, he gave Casey Tinnon information on another member of our community off the sign-in sheet. I quote, here's the name of the man who spoke at our board meeting. He wrote down the title of the Baptist preacher on the sign-in sheet. He was unacceptable in his response. The Associate Superintendent should not be doxing anybody. Would it be okay if someone was to take a picture of all the sign-in sheets while they were standing there and use it against them? This is supposed to be a safe space for all to speak. This has caused distrust with the parents in the district. Tonight, I'm asking you to help ensure that this never happens again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, after Erica will be Nancy Lose. Good evening, board members. My name is Erica Karlstrom. I am also a um, teacher in the Rockland Unified School District. Um, and I would like to continue reading the letter um, that Sierra Taunt had previously written. I personally wrote to Amplify and received a letter from the CEO. I've emailed you each a copy of this letter. In short, Amplify Science does not teach anything resembling CRT or SEL or other divisive topics. Amplify Science is a K-8 core curriculum that blends hands-on investigations, literacy-rich activities, and interactive digital tools to empower students to think, read, write, and argue like real scientists and engineers. It is adopted in all 50 states and used by more than 5 million students in communities of all political persuasions. It has been embraced by states and school districts due to the high quality of this program. I would ask you to please reconsider your decision um, and ask that it, we should start this process over, that Amplify should be put back on the table so parents and teachers can review it once more. As a parent in the district, Thank you. Now we'll hear from Nancy, and after Nancy is Kurt Weidman. Um, the last time I was here was to celebrate the end of 36 years of teaching. And the problem is with being a teacher is that you never quit being a teacher. So when I heard that you had, the board, has summarily dismissed the advice of experienced educators, this is what makes me concerned. 
You cannot invalidate teacher input when it comes to district decisions, whatever they are. Teachers are the heart and soul of any district, and it's especially true of Rockland. Our teachers go above and beyond to support their students. They are continually adjusting to make up for weaknesses in curriculum assigned to them to teach. Without these dedicated teachers, Rockland School District would not have achieved such recognition as top-ranking school system. There's a saying, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. In a school district, read it, if teachers ain't happy, nobody's happy. Not the students, not the parents, not the community, not the real estate agents, nobody. <laughs> As a school board in charge of educating 11,405 students, you're Thank you, Nancy. After Kurt will be Jen Brookover. Hello, board uh, and superintendent. Um, the clear point that I think everybody's missing is that the superintendent and the administration did not follow ed code with public input and parental input, community input on curriculum adop adoption. So um, everybody would like to emote and say, hey, we should adopt this because the experts have, done, have said so. But there's a lot in ed code I don't like, but we still have to comply with it. And that, and that, that threshold was not met. Got 26 seconds. Um, Travis spoke for 16 minutes, and, and Roger another four minutes talking about collaboration. And there wasn't 20 minutes of collaboration with the parents in community on the adoption of that science uh, curriculum. So I think we can do a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Up next is Jen Brookover, and after Jen will be Carrie Cardoso. Jen Brookover, I live in Rockland. I have kids at Valley View Elementary School. I'm going to start with a quote. This transgender, this transgender crap is wrong. It's a violation of the image of God, the sexual perversion of all this LGBTQ, all the alphabets. This was stated by Greg Farrington, the head of Destiny Church. By partnering with Destiny, you as a school district are sending a very clear message to your LGBTQ plus students, staff, and families that they don't matter. If RUSD truly cares about equity and their LGBTQ plus students, you will no longer hold events at Destiny. You will no longer have AP tests for students to take at Destiny. You will issue a statement dis denouncing these homophobic and transphobic comments. Thank you. Thank you. After Carrie will be Shannon Cantonella. Carrie Cardoso, I uh, proudly have three children um, enrolled in RUSD, specifically Quarry Trail Elementary. I also have not one, not two, but three family members that are currently employees. Um, I work for a company that we actually <laughs> have been on campus at Valley View for the past few weeks doing a six week PE program teaching dance. So I'm highly dedicated to this district. I appreciate everything that Ed Services has done to create fabulous education for my children, the teachers that I trust. Um, I'm gonna start by saying I'm very proud of these girls. I too am a victim, 15 years old in high school that I had to face the boy every single day, but I'm here to live and I'm here to say that this is an opportunity that parents can speak up, that individuals can step up and we don't have to do this anymore. I survived barely, but I'm here and I have my three children and I'm very thankful for the move that we did to come here. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you for your time. Up next is Shannon Cantonella. Happy Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, I really love our teachers at our school. My name's Shannon, and I'm a Rockland Unified parent, and um, I'm really concerned, and tonight just <laughs> Triple, triples that down on what's gone down. Um, I'm so proud and impressed 
those students got up here and told their story and their parents were here and gave you the full picture, I really want to see you do something about it. I've got 30 seconds. I was here to talk about science um, in support of science and tell you that I feel like you, the board has betrayed the stakeholders here. You've got a bunch of people here who are dedicated parents who do everything, who sit on your all your LCAPs, all your site councils, all your PTCs, and they all wrote you emails and you all dismissed them. With the last 10 seconds, what I want to say is I know that there's also a history of dismissal of things that went down at Whitney and the football team. I'd really like for you guys to get a handle on that. Thank you, Sharon. Okay, up next is Gemma Marizo, and after Gemma will be Di Diane Ancona. Evening. Um, I am a mom of three, a Granite Oaks mom, and a Breen mom. And um, I'm here to talk about science, but it is very hard to focus on science when some very real things entered this room. Um, I hope it is followed up on. I am petrified to send my daughter to Rockland High School. That was scary. So, huh. There's been a lot of talk about valuing Rockland parent voices. I am the parent voice that is sitting on LCAP. I am on Roger Stock's advisory committee. I'm on PTCs. I am the parent showing up. And I weighed in on this curriculum. I know you want transparency. That's a big uh, something I hear come from you guys regularly. So we're asking for a little transparency, too. I'm requesting more transparency around the decision about why you didn't pass this curriculum. I know you want to hear the parent voices, but what we have here is nobody mentioned this curriculum. Additionally, we're going to pass the safety review, but that lengthy review process that so many educators are a part of. What are the costs? What's the loss to Rockland Unified School District? The parents need to know. I don't understand denying a fully vetted curriculum that was actually shared with the public and that positive was unanimously approved by Rockland Unified School District and doctoral level educators. This decision feels political and is not in the best interest of the students. Thank you, Gemma. <laughs> After Diane will be Rose Sponder. Uh, Diane and Kona, I have two children in the district at Granite Oaks and Rockland. And I'm glad I'm reading a letter on behalf of a teacher because of everything we heard tonight. I'm not sure I would be able to put my thoughts together. I'm reading this on behalf of Adrian Takla. She's a 20-year student and a current Rockland High School teacher. If you are a parent of children who attend any Rockland Unified Schools, you may already know, but I will make this clear, a great inequity in the science curriculums between elementary schools exist. That is why I was thrilled when the district had found such a quality curriculum for all of its elementary schools. This curriculum comes from world-renowned UC Berkeley and Lawrence Hall of Science, which should be thrilling to anyone who claims to value quality education and has the interest of all district children in mind. It is also in line with the requirements of the state. A curriculum that includes engaging, hands-on learning, as this curriculum does, is what my children and all other RUSD children need and deserve, no matter what school they attend. I expect the curriculum to be current and reflective of the world that our kids live in. I also expect it to be scholarly, yet accessible to my Thank you, Diane. Thank you very much. After Rose will be T.S. Hamilton. I'm Rose Sponder. I live in Rockland. I have children at Whitney High School and Rockland High School. Um, I can say that from what I know from my own Rockland student, um, the testimony you heard from students at Rockland is not, um, they're not alone. Um, disrespecting girls at Rockland happens often. Please take it seriously. The students are asking you to. Um, very briefly, I want to echo a lot of the comments about the science curriculum not being adopted. There was a lot of effort by parents and teachers, um, people who are academic professionals, to vet this curriculum. They said it was the best curriculum. It had been uh, piloted for younger classes, why aren't we adopting it? Um, you replaced your feelings with the process that was in place, and you did betray us. And you have um, 
I After TS will be Allison Wheeler. Superintendent Stock, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, real quickly, uh, more power to those young ladies, those mothers, those families, for having the courage to stand up here this evening. Um, as a learning and development professional, professional educator, and a uh, parent of uh, two Parker Whitney students, um, I'm deeply concerned with this board's offhand dismissal of the Amplified Science program. Uh, famously or infamously, our country continues to lack, uh, beh lag behind the rest of the world in language arts and mathematics, and I would say extend that to all of education and science uh, notwithstanding. And uh, I would just seriously ask this board to reconsider, uh, to, to reevaluate their adoption of the Amplified Science program. Thank you. Thank you. Up now is Allison, and after Allison will be Teresa Landon. I'm going to keep it short and sweet. Um, I have one child of Parker Whitney, and I have one child about to go into Rockwood High, and she's a girl. I'm really scared at this point. Um, I might reconsider that after today's discussions. Um, but I understand the Amplified Science program was rejected because there was not enough parent involvement. So before I was a parent, I became a microbiologist. So if you need more science involvement, I'm here. I'm volunteering. I will be part of the committee. I will review every single science program you have, if that's what it takes. Because science belongs in every single grade, forever. There are not enough scientists out there. Thank you. Now is Teresa Landon, and after Teresa will be Matthew Oliver. I, um, I had put in to speak on the last agenda item, and I wasn't called up, and I, so I was wondering if I get three minutes I for that. I am actually so sorry. That was not um, noticed. What is the protocol for that? If the board wishes, it can grant three minutes because it was on the previous previous item it was just on the communication I see on here now I'm sorry it was missed yeah, yeah so yeah, on no 10.2 you may have three minutes okay thank you um, so on the last subject going back to just the discussion on um, ex marketing to attract families that's what I wanted to talk about and just share my story about how I came to the schools here in Rockland um, it was literally 10 years ago almost to the week that it was about time for open houses and we were considering buying a home um, here and so we went to Sunset Ranch and we checked it out and we looked at the website um, and the reason you know the one thing I think set it apart and helped me decide Rockland over um, Roseville City School District was the science um, I walked into the room the lab which was actually um, staffed by um, trustee member counters wife um, who used to work there and um, that's what set it apart that's why we came. That's what attracted me um, to this school district. Um, so I was really sad to see that you know my fifth grade daughter now has no science curriculum. Um, those are the things parents look for. Um, all of these programs that were amazing, and I just feel so disappointed that the amazing work that Sundeep does to attract people, that this staff has done to attract people. Um, we had STEM days when um, Mr. McDonald was our principal. Um, and now we've gone and everything's just dissolved. And so in terms of attracting families, we need a solid good science curriculum. Um, so that was my discussion on attracting families related to science and that, you know, if we can't do the basics, um, all the extra frills aren't gonna matter um, if we can't, you know, give fifth graders, fourth graders, third graders, thousands of children access to good quality science like they've had in the past, and I just want that to continue and come back. So I'd ask that you'd reconsider um, your vote and that you would include, you know, 
just adopt the national curriculum that it's all across. That was an option. You didn't consider any options, and that was really disappointing. Now, on to my one minute, because of all the stuff that happened here. Um, I wasn't really even gonna say much, but just to confirm that this is a systemic issue that I really hope you address. Um, I won't read names, but this was an email from 2018 um, that took place at Whitney High School. Dear Mr. So-and-so, a staff member, first off, I want to apologize again for my involvement in all of this and my lack of total honesty when I first spoke with you. I also want to apologize to blank for any embarrassment or hardship this has caused her. Over the summer, myself and two of my friends were hanging out. Um, we knew this girl, he was talking to her, and she invited us over to her house to have sex. So-and-so videotaped me having sex with so-and-so and sent me the video. I do not have Snapchat, and my mom keeps my Instagram open on her phone, as well as she has apps on my phone to see my messages. So I wanted to be cool, and I sent it to my friend. Thank you, Teresa. Up next is Matthew Oliver, and after Matthew will be Amanda Dixon. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. I am a resident of Rockland, a parent of Rockland children, and I have two daughters. And my heart breaks for these young students and their stories. I applaud each and every one of these girls for their bravery to stand up and speak. And I am thankful that we have a board that cares and is willing to make strong stands and will take decisive action. Our schools must be safe places for all. And I am looking forward to hearing the findings and the actions to keep all students safe. We have heard today from parents and that parents care and they should be heard. And then there are others who are saying, well, let's silence the voice of those parents. I'm glad that these sessions are recorded because in regards to the science curriculum and any curriculum moving forward, you made it crystal clear time and time again that you want parent involvement. A requirement of the state in section code 6002 shall promote parents' involvement in new curriculum. And we were told last week that there was Thank you, Ma Matthew. And now, Amanda Dixon. Thank you. My name is Amanda Dixon, a proud mom, uh, two boys in the Rockland School District. Uh, I came here for a different reason, to thank you for helping me on a personal note, uh, but pertaining to the science topic. Uh, after some quick research pursuant to the educational code, which Matthew just pointed out, Educational Code Section 60002, each district board shall provide for substantial teacher involvement in the selection of instructional materials and shall promote the involvement of parents and other members of the community in the selection of instructional materials. If parents are asking why this happened, thank you for following the law. You did, you did your job. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, and that was our last comment for the evening. Now on to pending agenda items. Trustees, do you have any items to be placed on the pending agenda? Yes, I would like to propose an item to go on to next meeting's agenda. I would envision it to go after the agenda item, at some point after the agenda item where we discuss parent involvement policy because that was added to the agenda at the last meeting. Following the comment that we've had, also following President Hupp, your repeated comments to the effect of tabling the item of, regarding Amplify curriculum, I would like to suggest that we bring it back for further discussion following that conversation and vote on parent involvement. We have, we have things to consider here related to the committee that was in place. Some of these teachers are also parents. 
we obviously need to discuss parent involvement, and so we need to see where it meets it, where it doesn't. We saw after the last meeting that we have the ability to take rapid action to increase parent involvement in the form of sending out physical postcards related to the high school grade science curriculum. They are also hosting an in-person information night, which we did not do for elementary. One thing that I have learned in the conversations following the meeting is that increased parent outreach and involvement is well received by the community. What I have not gathered is that because parents did not fill out the comment form, that that was a rejection of the curriculum and the teacher's recommendation. And I would like to see further conversation if um, I have support on the board for that. Okay, so I wanna be clear on what you're asking to be put on the agenda. I, I think there were two separate things. Um, it sounds like you would like to have an agenda item to discuss parent involvement in uh, curriculum selection. So we already have that added. So we oh, will see. be doing that. That was added as a future agenda item last time. So pending that, because we kind of moved the goalposts last time. We had the process. We talked about it for these other grades. We're making it work for them. We decided we weren't gonna make it work for this, but we also have more information, and it seems that it would make sense that once we formulate our approach to this, that then we could consider the work of the teachers that, to one person's question, has cost the district upwards of $25,000 already. And I know that we have talked about costs, so it's a consideration. So to be clear, you would like to uh, have an agenda item to discuss Amplify Science specifically? Yes, in the lens of the parent involvement that we discuss and vote on, because it's a, going to be a, an action item, and see about maybe remedial action that we can take, as we have done with the high school science, to provide that extra opportunity for awareness for discussion, for outreach, so that we can make sure that we capture everyone, or to the, we know, you never get everyone. But I do think that it was clear that the district didn't do their due diligence in the outreach for this. The email was not enough, and people didn't know. But I would like to see further discussion. I want to be clear. Are there questions? Because I'm not sure I'm fully clear. So I, to be clear, it's to, I don't know if we would need to vote on it or if it would be a discussion. I think when we're looking at this curriculum, whether it's the national, whether it's everything, you know, I think we clearly have options there that has been discussed. I imagine there's some kind of time frame, and we have taken very rapid action to get more outreach for high school. So if that's something that we decide is appropriate, would we have the option to vote on it? I would think that that would be appropriate as an action item. So it sounds like, I'm sorry, did you want to ask? It sounds like you're, um, you are talking about discussing parent involvement, which is already on the agenda. So I'm having a hard time separating because what's different. It, to look at it in regards to Amplify, to look at it and say, okay, we need more parent involvement. This is the system. The teachers and the community operated under the system. It wasn't adequate. Can we make it right to still move forward with this curriculum in some capacity, whether it be modified, whether it be directly as recommended, given that discussion on parent involvement and ways to achieve it? I'll jump in on this. Um, Michelle, I appreciate you putting forth. What I'm hearing is that you would like to revisit a vote on Amplify in specific. Um, and I, I do feel that my comments that evening were very clear um, for a variety of concerns regarding specifically Amplify. 
Um, I, I don't see it as um, a request I support to revisit specifically Amplified. I'm very open to looking at the other 12 to 15 curriculums that were mentioned to us. Um, this was not a surprise. These are actually conversations that we've been having for two years, uh, multiple members of this board, conversations we've had with administration. Um, when this first hit the table, it was conversations in the information session of concerns about lack of parent involvement. Um, and specifically, there was conversation that evening quite extensively about um, elementary um, that some of us board members, I'll speak for myself, uh, do view, view processes different for elementary and secondary, and that conversation was handled during both agenda items last meeting. Um, and then specifically, I had shared that I had heard many negative concerns and comments from the community specifically regarding Amplify. So that night, I made a decision uh, that I was very clear about, that I was concerned with Amplify in specific. In addition, I was concerned to parents being included in the process. They were two concerns I had. And so I will just be fully outright honest. Um, I do not support personally it being brought back for a vote. However, I'm willing to look at the other 12 to 15 curriculums. Thank you. So if, if this has been a discussion for two years, then why did we allow the teachers to resume this and spend all the time and effort? This. So I, I actually will speak on that, even though it wasn't, I didn't bring it up. It wasn't the curriculum that was a discussion. It was this, the members of this board have been saying since elected, I, parent involvement needed to be top priority. It wasn't the curriculum that was discussed for two years. But just, I, parent involvement is a priority, but is it top priority when we're 15 years overdue on this? And the, the public is asking for clarity on why Amplify was rejected. And if we're going to be discussing and creating new parameters for parent involvement next time, why didn't we just table it, like you said, and talk about it after we come up with a system? That was appropriate. That was appropriate. With all due respect, Amplify was not on the agenda for this evening. Therefore, it's inappropriate for us to have extended conversations about Amplify when members of the community were not notified of that. A request has been made to add an agenda item. If there's a second, let's address that. That would be my request as a board member. Do we have a second? Okay. In the absence of a second, we will um, move on. And if there is nothing else, okay, uh, go ahead. I do have another. I don't know if there's an appropriate time to address this. I know that we cannot specifically discuss cases or items, but I do think there were very concerning actions that were shared tonight and I think it would be inappropriate of me not to mention my concern in general as a board member. Um, I know our district is um, very concerned about the safety of our students um, and so again I understand that I cannot engage fully on those items um, but I can't leave tonight without at least making a comment um, that I, I'm looking I guess for direction from you Superintendent Stock of what we can and cannot do regarding the very serious concerns that were shared tonight. Uh, Trustee Sadoff, I, I appreciate you expressing concern. I, I know it was, it was felt by everyone in the room that listened to the comments uh, tonight. Um, what what we will I will be working with um, uh, staff tomorrow morning, first thing to um, do uh, more review of some of the issues that have been brought to light and have been investigated along with law enforcement. But there, are, from my understanding, there's been some new allegations that, that surfaced this evening that that will absolutely look into. In addition to just looking into the individual accusations and ensuring supports provided to students um, who, who clearly, um, you, know, uh, you know, should have that support, is we'll also be working to take a look at how do we uh, address th these issues, uh, providing uh, not just in consequences, but also training and also in 
uh, ways we look at the whole uh, support related to any of these types of issues within our athletic programs and cultures in our schools because whether individual accusations, you know, we'll deal with the consequences that are appropriate or not through investigations, but I think there's also a need or uh, definitely a look need for us to look at how do we go beyond individual accusations, individual people, hold accountable as appropriate, provide support, but then look at how do we um, ensure that this type of, um, uh, any of these types of things that may foster this type on our programs are addressed in a more systemic way, regardless of an individual student or athlete has been involved, but we wanna make sure that nothing like this, uh, you know, anybody, any student feels like this type of thing occurs in, in our campuses. So we'll be working to continue to investigate the individual pieces and accountability, but also look at how moving forward we address these issues systemically within our programs because, again, um, the uh, feelings here tonight were, 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 were genuine and, and we want to, you know, respect and we all want our students to feel safe. So again, we'll work. And so that part where the outcome of that will be, Trustee Sadoff, is that we'll um, provide re information and report back to the board. Uh, individual issues of student discipline and adult uh, discipline is confidential. And so we'll be report sharing back with the board through uh, that in, in closed session as appropriate. And then, but we'll, as we work forward and look into this further, um, we, we can uh, consider, uh, you know, updating it in some way on actions that'll be taken going forward uh, beyond just individual accountability, but in how we look at our, our programs and we, and we work to infuse that. So that's just, you know, uh, thinking off the top of the head of, of how we respond to both the individual issues related to students and staff, and then also how do we move forward programmatically school-wide. All right, this meeting is now adjourned to closed session.